Center. Dwight Gooden will take the next big step in his effort to recover fully from his drug problem and come back fully to pitch effectively for the New York Mets. Here this evening, before a rather supportive crowd and certainly a sellout of 55,000, Dwight will take the mound against a team that he has dominated in the National League, the Pittsburgh Pirates, in an effort to come all the way back from a very serious problem. Back on April 30th, after spending a month in the Smithers Institute, Dwight returned to baseball and made his first appearance in the Mets clubhouse. General Manager Frank Cashin made that initial announcement. All of us here with the New York Mets are delighted to have Doc back with the team. We go around talking about baseball like it ought to be, and it is our considered opinion that the New York Mets is where Dwight Gooden ought to be. Frank Cashin and the Mets have been criticized for sheltering Dwight quite a bit during his rehabilitation. And in fact, his only stint before the press also came in that April 30th news conference when Dwight discussed his problem for the first and only time so far. I know I made a mistake and I regret it a lot, but I must turn the page once again because life goes on. And I want to put all this behind me so I can get back to doing things I like, and that's playing baseball and having fun once again. But I threw on the side today, ran a little bit, and I felt great. And um, things will be better. Thank you. While the reception Dwight will receive from this sellout crowd of 55,000 here tonight is expected to be generally warm, the reception he has already received from his teammates has been nothing but warm, and that has been expressed by team captain Keith Hernandez. I think it's pretty apparent that we're all very happy to have Dwight back. <clears throat> the number one concern from the players is Dwight, the person. Um, getting him back to a healthy life and moving forward and closing this chapter in his life and moving forward ahead and playing, the, pitching the type of ball and being the type of person that he is. We've missed him, not only on the field, which is not as important, but we've missed him as a person. Uh, and uh, everybody is going to be totally supportive of him. So in an atmosphere reminiscent of last October's World Series, more media certainly on hand here at Shea tonight than since last October, Dwight Gooden returns. And of course, his success remains to be seen. The fans here at Shea and their reaction yet to be heard. We'll be right back with the start of the game, the Mets and the Pirates with Dwight Gooden on the mound. Hanover, the financial source worldwide. By Nissan, who invites you to test drive a hot new Nissan car or truck and see why Nissan makes you feel like driving. By the New York Daily News, New York's hometown paper. By the New Jersey Bell Yellow Pages. By your good old skies, the New York, New Jersey, and Southern Connecticut Oldsmobile dealers. And by the American Express car. Don't leave home without it. Pitching for the Pirates tonight and making his Major League debut, right-hander Mike Dunn, who is 3-5 and five at Vancouver with a 1.76 ERA. And on the mound for the Mets, the doctor returns, Dwight Gooden, who last year was 17-6 and six with an ERA of 2.84. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Ralph Kiner, along with Tim McCarver, Steve Sabrisky, and Rusty Staub. And a big night here on hand as Dwight Gooden finally makes his appearance for the first start of his season. And, of course, you've been documented on what has happened to Di Dwight since the problem started back in spring training. And, Tim, I know that you've been in World Series play, All-Star games, and Dwight Gooden has been in a World Series. And uh, I think that can help him because he's had the tremendous pressure of the World Series here tonight 
it should help him a little bit, but he's got to be extremely apprehensive. Yeah, I think what you're saying is he's been under the microscope, but not exactly this brand of microscope. Because I think more than anything else, people are going to watch and see how Dwight reacts tonight to the pressure. He's been under physical pressure before to get hitters out. This is a different type of pressure, and it remains to be seen, as Steve said, how he reacts. And the Mets are looking for some big help from Dwight Gooden with their depleted really? pitching staff. And we'll be back with the start of the ball game, the lineups, right after this message from Budweiser. Crowd to start his first game of this year. Gooden, of course, did pitch in the minor leagues. He was now working out, getting in shape. Practically had to go through spring training entirely anew. And in 26 innings pitched, he gave up 22 hits in the minors. Five earned runs, 11 walks, 27 strikeouts. Now Gooden takes the field and he gets a standing ovation. the ovation controversial but in my opinion the fans are not condoning but understanding I think that's well put Tim it certainly is a great scene to see all these people in back of Dwight Gooden trying to overcome the problem that he had a tremendously difficult problem something you hate to see in society something that has to be if it can be wiped out so true last year's record 17 and 6 with an earned run average of 2.84 was in 33 ball games he is making his 100th game start here today and this is the lineup Dwight will face Barry Bonds the left fielder leading off center fielder Andy Van Slyke batting second Johnny Ray at second baseman and he is a fine one he's batting third Sid Bream, the first baseman, hitting fourth. Jim Morrison at third, batting fifth. R.J. Reynolds, the right fielder, hitting sixth. Mike Lavalier has had a fine year so far, batting over 300 for the Pirates. That trade coming over with Van Slyke and the pitcher tonight, Mike Dunn. Rafael Belliard, the shortstop, hitting eighth, and Mike Dunn on the mound, batting ninth. And the defense behind Dwight Gooden, Keith Hernandez at first base, Backman at second, Santana at shortstop, Johnson at third. Wilson, Dykstra, and Strawberry in the outfield left to right. And the catcher is Gary Carter. So Gooden with a lifetime record of 58 victories and 19 losses. He is 6-0 lifetime against the Pirates, 2-0 last year, and making his debut. And his first batter will be Barry Bonds, hitting 270 with six home runs. And Bonds with a total of 21 runs battered in. He has hit... Dwight Goodenwell hitting 429 against him in the fastball swung on and fouled and it is out of play. So Gooden makes his first pitch of the year and it's in the strike zone. He's talking to Mike Lupica before the game and he said how hard he talked to Dwight before the game said how hard do you think the first pitch will be about 110 miles an hour. He said no about 80 miles an hour because Bonds will be taking anyway. So he swings away and fouls yeah, off right, the first pitch. Right. <laughs> Oh, it's a one strike count, a curveball, and in there for strike two, and Gooden breaking off a beautiful Lord Charles. Well, that's a good sign. Obviously, the early curveball from Gooden and a strike. Back to the fastball, and the count one ball and two strikes. Gooden, the only pitcher in baseball history to strike out 200 batters his first three years in the major leagues. And he struck him out. So Gooden starts off with a bang. He starts off with a bang by holding Barry Bonds bangless. High fastball. 
So the first man put away on the K. And Dr. K now will take on Andy Van Slyke. Van Slyke hitting 257, five home runs, 23 runs batted in. Andy had a five game hitting streak stop last night when he came in as a pinch hitter, and he takes the first pitch ball one. Van Slyke in his last six ball games, nine for 21. And the fastball for ball two. Gooden with a lifetime record against the Pirates of 6 and 0. And he misses again with a fastball at three balls, no strike. A sellout crowd. And there you see Dwight's career record. And he comes back and gets a strike. That puts a count at three balls and one strike. Billy Williams, a home plate umpire, John McSherry at first, Frank, Frank Pulley, the umpire at second, and Dana DeMuth, the umpire at third. And the fastball is popped up and it's playable. Howard Johnson making the call. And the catch. So good and back from a 3 0 count to pick up his second out. And that'll bring up Johnny Ray. Ray hitting 264, three home runs, 28 runs batted in. Yesterday he missed his first start as a player this year. He did appear in the ball game later on. Johnny Ray, a very durable player and also one of the toughest in the league to strike out. Switch hitter, better hitter from the left hand side, and the fastball, a ball call. Pirates is a team hitting 257 with 41 home runs. They have scored 220 runs this year. And the fastball grounded into the hole, cut off by Hackman. And Dwight Gooden works a 1 2 3 inning with a strikeout in his return to the Mets here in 1987. The score at the end of one half inning, the Pirates nothing, the Mets coming up. Now, here's a word from American Express. Three wins and five losses. He led the Pacific Coast League in earned run average at 1.76 before his recall. And Mike Dunn making his first appearance against the Mets. And the lineup: Len Dykstra leading it off, followed by second baseman Wally Backman, Keith Hernandez batting third, and Gary Carter behind the plate hitting fourth. Darrell Strawberry batting fifth, and Mookie Wilson in left field tonight due to the illness of Kevin McReynolds. Howard Johnson, the third baseman, hitting seventh. Rafael Santana at short batting eighth. And Dwight Gooden batting ninth. Bream, Ray, Belliard, and Morrison in the infield, first to third. Bonds, Van Slyke, and Reynolds in the outfield, left to right to catcher Lavalier. And the first pitch by Mike Dunn in there for a called strike. Mike making his first appearance. He's a, he was acquired along with outfielder Andy Van Slyke, catcher Mike Lavalier, in exchange for catcher Tony Pena. And that pitch of ball, one ball, one strike. Dykes for hitting 320, six home runs, 17 runs batted in. Dykstra an idea about Bunny. It's that split finger fastball that Mike Dunn like a lot of rookie pitchers a lot of young pitchers are starting to come up with now he's the seventh rookie pitcher on the Pirates team this year. It's a ton. And he's also the 13th player that played on the 1984 Olympic team to make it to the major leagues. Well, that's remarkable isn't it. That is really a remarkable stat. Of course they are all of the finest college players in the country but just because you sign a college player like that that doesn't mean that it's going to be a sure ticket surefire ticket to the big leagues. Think of the ones that missed. Yeah. And Dykstra doesn't make contact and he has struck out. So Mike Dunn in his major league debut striking out his Here first bat. Dunn attended six. Bradley Boom. University in Back Peoria right. Illinois for three years. That's a good tailing fastball right there. A lot of movement. So one away, and that'll bring up Wally Backman. Wally hitting 252, eight home runs. Make that no home runs, eight runs batted in. Both Dykstra and Backman not hitting well against the Pirates. Dykstra at 077 and Backman at 182. Dykstra one for 19 now against the Pirates, and Backman is two for 11. 
from there on the picture does brighten up. And it's ball two, two and all. Oh. When you talk about the pressure on Dwight Gooden and the unusual circumstances of his starting tonight, what about the unusual circumstances of Mike Dunn starting tonight, his major league debut against Gooden and the circumstances surrounding the Gooden appearance tonight? He won't forget it. No. <laughs> Packed house, Dwight Gooden, his opponent. The pressure is certainly on him. And the fastball, a strike, three and one. In 1986, as you look at this packed house here tonight, done at Louisville was 9 and 12. And he walks his next bat. So the Mets have the first base runner. And it will bring up Keith Hernandez. Yeah, Keith man. with 11 game hitting streak. Number 17. Batting 386 Keith. over the 11 games with 17 base hits. And he's now hitting 317 for the year with five home runs, 21 RBI. Keith has hit in 21 of his last 23 ball games, batting 380 over that period. Backman has not stolen many bases this year. And the Mets are going against a catcher that can throw anybody out. And the fastball for ball one. The year has thrown out 18, and a ball call has been called. And at the present rate of balk calls in the National League, they will set an all-time record. Balks are up 61% this year. And the reason this balk was called was because Mike Dunn didn't stop. Now, he didn't stop. But in fairness to Mike Dunn, almost no pitcher stops anymore. So why call it occasionally? You remember the crew that called the, the balk on David Cohn, the young right hander. Two box and two box with a pitcher on base both times. So a balk call and no pitch on Keith Hernandez. The count no balls, no strikes. And a strike call by Billy Williams. It's almost a slap on the hands as Hernandez does not like this call. Of course, the first pitch was no pitch because of the balk. Good movement by Mike Dunn. That split finger fastball really going down. He's hitting 389 against Pirate pitching this this year with one home run. And he hits the fastball off of the glove of the third baseman Jim Morrison. And that will go probably as an air. Backman holding at second base on the play. I'll tell you, Wally Backman almost no. broke toward third, but Dunn, remember now, his major league debut. He wrote. Uh, walked over to cover third. You see Backman after going back to second almost went to third base. He saw it was unguarded, but Dunn alertly went over to cover third base. So the Mets with runners at first and second and one away, and the batter will be Gary Carter. Carter hitting 235, five home runs, 25 RBIs. And Gary hitting 318 against the Pirates this year with one home run and seven runs batted in. Again, he didn't stop and no exactly, ball call. Exactly. He did not stop then any more than he did stop when the balk was called. Now watch. You gotta stop 1001. No Boom, difference. Go. No difference whatsoever. And the pitch in there for a call strike. It's one and one. Of course, if you stay, if an umpire starts calling it every time a pitcher doesn't come to a stop, I guarantee you Phil Necro would have 10,000 balks called against him. <laughs> in a season, not his career. He never stops. And there's a splitter, and it's a beauty. And one and two. You know, Carter was the one who protested so vehemently against Mike Scott. And now again, he sees one of those splitters. And there's the same move, and boy, does that one go down. Man. All the young pitchers have seen the success that Mike Scott and other pitchers have had, and they are going, obviously, to that split finger fastball with great success. Problem is, is it more damaging on the arms? That we won't know. Of course, Bruce Suter is sitting out again. Missed last year and this year, too. He was the man who really got it started in the major leagues. Great relief pitcher for the Cubs and then the Cardinals and now with Atlanta. 
One and two the count. Again the splitter this one in the dirt two and two. As we mentioned Mike Dunn led the Pacific Coast League and earned run average. One point seven six. Gave up only 12 earned runs in 61 and a third innings while pitching for Vancouver had a record of three and five. And the splitter again and it is low and this time Carter stayed off of it. And the count goes to three and two and the question here would you put the runners in motion. Gary Carter leads the Mets in double plays grounded into. And for that reason, I would send the runners. Got to guard against the strikeout if you do. That's up to the hitter, though. You got a big major league hitter here. Backman jockeying around at second base gets the attention of Mike Dunn. It appears that Backman is going to be running. Behind him, Keith Hernandez, and he has to get a good jump or he could be thrown out. Yeah, because Keith is obviously doesn't run nearly as well as Backman, and you might see LaValier throw for the trail runner. The runners do go and it's ball four and that loads them up. So the Mets with the bases loaded. As Jim Leland looks on the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates in his second year. Pirates finished last underneath him last year. Losing over 100 ball games. Bases loaded and Daryl Strawberry the batter. Daryl hitting 269, 15 home runs, 33 runs batted in. Now we're going to have a look at the pitching coach coming out. It is Ray Miller, former pitching coach of the Baltimore Orioles, former manager in the major leagues. He's going to talk to his young pitcher. Dunn happens to be born on the best day of the year. My birthday. <laughs> October 27, 1962, is born in South Bend, Indiana. And last year, the Mets clinched the World Series on my birthday. What a party. Right. First time in my whole career I ever saw a ball game in the Major Leagues on my birthday. They never played that late before. So Ray Miller talking to his young pitcher Strawberry waits for his first pitch. And it's grounded out to the second base side. They'll try for two and they miss the play at second base. One run scores on the air and the bases are still loaded. song you can't hide those lion eyes that's what Raphael Belliard wishes he could do right there that ball is playable but his eyes were on Gary Carter ball hit to the right side and that's the only type of ball that Belliard could turn for a double play took his eye off the ball because of Carter charging one nothing New York and they say haste makes waste and it was there as the Mets get the run on the air by the shortstop Belliard and the batter now Mookie Wilson the count one ball no strikes. Mookie hitting 236 with four home runs 13 runs batted in. And a ground ball to shortstop they won't get two but they do get one. And the Mets get another as Hernandez scores and the Mets are leading by a score of two to nothing. I'll tell you because you can't anticipate a double play the error on Belliard gives no, Strawberry no, no, no. an RBI. No, no, no. And the same with Mookie Wilson. Howard. For Wilson, his 14th RBI of the year and his 34th for Strawberry. Tacky inning for the Pirates. So now the batter will be Howard Johnson, the Mets leading 2 0 without a base hit. Tacky is a very appropriate word when you think about it. You know, this is, I mean, this has been a tacky inning. And well, the walk, the balk, the error, the error. Yeah. Not a good major league baseball half inning played by the Pirates. Pirates currently in last place, trailing by seven and a half games. They've won 23 and lost 26. And the first pitch to Johnson, a call strike. One 
for 12 against the Pirates this year, hitting 233 for the year with eight home runs, 26 RBI. Mookie, a threat to steal at first base. He draws some attention. Well, normally I think he'd be less of a threat to steal with Johnson, the hitter, because of a left-hander, Santana falling. But Santana's been swinging the bat. I'd say, go ahead and steal it. Forget the hole at first base. Johnson grounds it foul, and Bill Robinson, the first base coach, flags it on by. Two strikes to count on Howard Johnson. If I were Lavalier, I'd pitch out here. He's looking over to Jim Leland, the manager of the Bucks. We saw San Francisco Giant manager Roger Craig calling some pitch outs, and Leland does the same thing. So at two strikes, the runner goes, and the ball hit to the second baseman, Johnny Ray. And Ray will pick up the out at first base, and that'll do it. So the Mets get two runs without a base hit. There were two errors in the inning, and two members left on. The score at the end, the one, the Mets two, and the Pirates nothing. Now here's a word from the good old guy. Good, and what a bad year he had last year. Now digest this if you would. And leading off, and leading these off are the second inning. Some of the Both greatest the pitchers Pirates, in the history of the game. Five. And good first ranks baseman, fourth for his third three. year. The three guys better, Cy Young, Tom Seaver, and Warren Spahn. All the other great pitchers struggle through their third year. Good and not so. And right now we're back to work in the first pitch to Sid Bream topped out the third. Johnson there, and he throws him out. So Howard Johnson on one pitch picks up the out. Green coming to the plate hitting 295 with eight home Number runs, 24 two, RBI. Third baseman, Jim Morrison. That'll bring up Jim Morrison. Morrison batting 271 with five home runs, 30 runs batted in. Morrison is second in the National League in two base hits with 17. He's hit the Mets well, batting 368 against the Mets with seven base hits. He's had one home run and two runs batted in. And the fastball for ball one. You're watching Mets Baseball 87 on WWOR TV, Secaucus, New Jersey. Morrison's average against White is 0 56, 1 for 18. And the fastball popped up into shallow left field. It might drop, but coming hard is Mookie. Speed eats it up. Well, you said it exactly right, Ralph. Wilson had broken back, but a guy with Mookie's speed can afford to break back one step. Now batting for the Pirates. Going forward, few outfielders in the National League get there as quickly as Mookie. Reynolds. Talking about what you do in your third year there is a pitcher named Wes Farrell that got off to the second best start ever Dwight Gooden the best at 19 he was 0 and 0 at 20 he was 0 and 2 at 21 years of age he was 21 and 10 and at 22 years of age he was 25 and 13 at 23 he was 22 and 12 at 24 he was 23 and 13 so Gooden has that mark to shoot at that's the best if you go into the fourth, fifth, and sixth years. Wes Farrell not in the Hall of Fame. His brother is. One ball, no strikes, a count to R.J. Reynolds. And he has a big swing and a fastball and fouls it back. Reynolds hitting 308 for the year with one home run and 14 RBIs. Well, that's because that the, those that vote on those that enter the Hall of Fame put more importance on catchers than they do pitchers, and that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely right. <laughs> Wes Farrell also hit more home runs than any pitch in the history of baseball. He hit 38 in his major league career. Played the outfield some of the time. Two and one, the count to R.J. Reynolds. Mets leading two nothing without a base hit. Two errors by the Pirates opening up the gate. Mets drove right on through to score two. Gooden with a 2-1 pitch and he goes to the curveball for the second time in the game and 
he misses with it. Wow. Cardinals remain hot, beating the Cubs for the second straight time. That increases their lead to three full games over the Cubs. And it is strike two. R.J. Reynolds, if you remember, hit a leadoff home run against Gooden last year in Pittsburgh. The first home run hit, of course, in stock, a game in which Gooden won four to two. And it's fouled away, and the count at three balls and two strikes. And one good sign when you see Gooden pitching here tonight, the foul balls. Gooden at his best threw up an awful lot of foul balls. That means the ball has movement. Gooden's first strikeout in the major leagues was Dickie Thon back on April 7, 1984 in his first game. And again, a foul ball. Gooden again with a 3 2 count. And he walks him on a high fastball. So the first base runner against Gooden, R.J. Reynolds. And it will bring up Mike Lavalier. Number four, catcher Mike Lavalier. You're hitting 301 with no home runs, 11 runs batted in. Spanky and his gang. <laughs> He's built a lot like Smokey Burgess, isn't he? Smokey, the great pinch hitter and catcher. Throw to first base. Of course, Spanky from the Our Gang series didn't have a mustache, did he? I don't think so. <laughs> he was only four, wasn't he? <laughs> Very close as Reynolds dives back. <laughs> Pirates will run. They have been successful 76% of the time. And 27 of their last 30 attempts. They've had 50 stolen bases and 66 attempts. And they're trailing 2 0 in this game. A good spot to attempt a stolen base. Good again over there. Looks considerably thinner. He shed about 10 pounds over the last two months. A little heavy in spring training. Did not have a good spring. He was no. very bad in spring training with an earn run average of 7.31 and 16 innings pitch. Gave up 21 hits, walked six, and only struck out seven. There goes the runner, and the pitch is taken for a strike. Carter's throw is not in time. Well, you call it, Ralph, and call it correctly. He, Reynolds had a terrific jump at first base. And the high kick from Good. See Reynolds about four steps in motion, and Gary Carter coming out made a pretty strong throw, but Reynolds in there. So the stolen base puts a runner in scoring position. 51 for the Pirates in stolen bases. And the one strike pitch is strike two call. Wow, you're one for nine against Gooden. That was when he was with the Cardinals. Good curveball, and Lavalier you're lucky to get his bat on that one. Howled it into the Mets dugout. Lavalier's hitting the ball well, batting over 300, as we said, and over 100 at bats. And when you're locked in like that, you do put your bat on a lot of good pitches. Those are the types of pitches you want to get a hitter out on, and Lavalier just made contact, fought it off. And the fastball for a ball, it's one and two. 
Brown here is definitely behind the white good. Gooden right now should have settled out. He should have it in pretty good control. He had to be extremely nervous. But he's doing what he says he likes. Playing baseball. Again the curve and ball two. Two balls, two strikes. One of the things about Dwight that was certainly noticeable was his lack of excitement or at least overt excitement since he's come up to the big leagues. It's not a real surprise to see a rather stoic appearance on his face. And again the fastball and it goes to three and two even though of course he's never been tested like this. Circumstances surrounding Dwight totally different than they were three years ago when he came up. Runner at second base, Mets leading 2 0. Top of the second inning, two men out. Curveball left him there. Gooden gets his second strikeout, and that ends the inning. A walk and one left to score at the end of one and a half innings. The Mets 2 and Pittsburgh nothing. Now, here's a word from McDonald's. The pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates, Mike Dunn. He had a ball called on him in his first inning to work, and now Ray Miller is showing him why they called the balk. And why they called the balk, no one really knows, except maybe Tim McCarver, who's an advocate of the balk call. <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of consistency on the balk call. You see LaValliere counseling Dunn, who came or who became un, or who came undid <laughs> undone right they did him in yeah the Mets trying to undo done some more pirates what? are the are the enemy so far in this ball game I was gonna say what's done cannot be undone as Lady Macbeth said friend of yours Lady Macbeth not a bad right. dancer either <laughs> one and out of Santana Rafi batting 264 and he's been red hot Grounds is it foul, 1 and 1. Santana hitting 328 in his last 21 ball games, and he has raised his average up to a very respectable 264. Little looper caught by Ray. Santana has been going through quite a bit of wood Number here lately. Reminds you of Tony Pena. Here's good. good. Reminds me of Woody Hart Herman, Woodchopper's ball. <laughs> Only does it swing a liquor stick, does it? No. Two years ago, Gooden had more hits than any Met pitcher ever. He had 21, and he takes a fastball low. Two to nothing, New York on top. Gooden has yet to give up a hit. He retired the Pirates in order in the first and a walk with two out to R.J. Reynolds, the only base runner for Pittsburgh. Gooden's average fell down quite a bit in 1986, as you can see. Lines of foul, two and one. the eyes of the baseball world on this young man tonight. Ground ball towards short. Belliard backed up, came forward, throws him out. Two outs. And that'll bring up the top of the order. Len Dykstra the batter. Lenny struck out his first time up. Lenny Dykstra. The Mets play four games in three days with the Day game tomorrow against the Pirates. It'll be Doug Drabeck against Sid Fernandez, and then the Banner Day doubleheader on Sunday. Rick Rushel and Bob Kipper against John Mitchell and Tom Eatons. Dykstra fouls it off 0 1. Saturday's game is sold out. We invite you to take public transportation coming to the ballpark. It's cap day here at Shea, but Sunday's game and Banner Day between games of the doubleheader is not. So tickets available for that doubleheader, the first of the year for the Mets. 
a scheduled doubleheader. Come out and enjoy this glorious weather. Boy, low in humidity today, about 80 degrees. Just an absolutely lovely evening. 0 and 2 to Dykstra. Sit down the bleachers, soak up some rays. I like to do a game in my swimming trunks. Want to do a Harry Carey? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. Carry the Cub broadcaster sits in the bleachers at times. Base hit for Dykstra. <laughs> of course, Bob Prince and the Pittsburgh Pirates for many times, many years, used to broadcast in the shorts in the broadcast booth. And here's a base hit by Dykstra. That's only his second hit against the Pirates in 20 at bats this, this year. Nobody knew that at the time, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Statute of limitations <laughs> is all. Late Bob Prince. The gunner. Good buddy of yours, Ralph. Good man. He really was, was a great man. He was Mr. Pittsburgh. Wally Backman, the batter. And a fastball just misses outside. Wally walked and scored a run in the first inning. Of course, Bob Prince was preceded by Rosie Rosewell, who was a character in his own right. DeRocher once got kicked out of a ball game and wanted to listen to the game so he could send out instructions to his lieutenants. And he couldn't understand what Rosie was broadcasting. A doozy Marooney to right field. Open the window and many. Those were some of his expression. What was it? Well, you're going to have to explain it to me. What was a doozy Marooney? Well, actually, it was a flare. Kind of a flare base hit. One of those little Texas Ligers. And open the window how many was a home run call. And then the glass would shatter and he'd say she never made it. Bob Prince had to drop the box that had the glass in it. Dykstra running and Backman fouls it away. Still one and one. Any other jewels that you could share with I can, us? I can see you standing on your chair dropping a big <laughs> box of uh, shattered glass. <laughs> Actually, Rosie Rosewell grabbed a microphone out of Bing Crosby's hand. The only time Bing ever lost a microphone in his life. Bing was broadcasting the pirate game. I hit a home run, and Rosie took the mic right out of Bing's hand so he could say, open the window at many. He keep his job after that? He did. That's how strong he was. Well, maybe that gave Bob he didn't. Prince an entree into his <laughs> job. <laughs> He didn't work in any Bing's pictures. Though. <laughs> that would have been a new, a new Bing Crosby picture, The Road to Unemployment, starring Rosie Rosewell. And the cast of thousands. <laughs> Here's Lavalier looking over at Jim Leland. We talked last inning about the possibility of the pitch out call. Not really a bad idea if the manager is just calling a pitch out. I am not a proponent of managers calling signs. Watch this. Cheek, cap, cheek, ear, cheek. Perfect count right here to be running on the pitch. Dunn steps off. So it's one and two to Backman. Two outs. Two to nothing New York. We're in the second inning. Thaxter with a short lead. Dunn steps off again. When a pitcher steps off a couple of times, that usually is an indication that there will be no pitch out. We'll see. Also usually is an indication of a quick pitch. The pitch out sign is up. Not pitching out, but it was high and away. Two and two to Backman. Hey, if you pitch out here, you better be sure. You wouldn't do that to a young pitcher. Does put a lot of big bird if the runner isn't running. Two and two, two outs. Throw to first, another indication that there probably won't be a pitch out. Fastball outside, strong throw, got him. 
Boy, a fine throw by Mike Lavalier. No runs a hit, none left. After two, it's two to nothing New York. And we'll be back after this word from Manufacturers Hanover. Batter, Mike Lavalier, 3-2, and this is what happened. And right here, a 3-2 curveball, a big psychological pitch, because everybody that's paying attention that's a hitter says he threw a curveball on 3-2. and two. I got to be ready for that. Boy, that is so true. From a psychological standpoint, it can really set up a game for a pitcher. The Pirates hitless against Goodman. Belliard took us a ball. It was high. 1-0 to Rafael Belliard. Strike one. Belliard bat batting 214. You know, in effect, Gooden did two things. He got the out of Lavalier and then set up the pardon me, set up the possibility of hitters thinking that Gooden is prone to throw that pitch behind in the count. Here's a list of the pitches. Now Gooden and you have to give Carter credit for calling that pitch because a base hit there would have driven a run in. And it did a lot of things. Struck out the batter and got them thinking. And it was a good time to call it because you got a left-handed hitter up there, even though he was one for nine lifetime, but you had your number eight hole hitter hitting in Rafael Belliard. It's two and two to Rafael. Fastball is low, three and two. Two to nothing, New York is leading two unearned runs in the first inning. Mets scoring two without a hit. On deck batter is Mike Dunn. Fastball is high, so Gooden loses Belliard. And Belliard will be at first with nobody out. And here comes Hernandez to talk to Gooden. That will put Dunn in a bunning situation. have to think that Keith is saying, okay, he's going to be bunting here, and I'm going to be charging Number to work out some kind of a deal when I come back. Mike Dunn. Mets will try to get a sure out. Dunn batting, of course, from the left side, his first major league at bat. Maybe his first professional at bat. Hernandez charging, and this one foul back. Johnson also charging then. And you got Gooden on the mound, who is also an outstanding fielding pitcher. Good athlete. Dunn has a rather famous number on his back. Famous in many places, New York especially. Well, a press conference will be called tomorrow morning at 10.30, and speculation is that it will be an announcement of some way, of some form, about Tom Seaver number to which you refer. I didn't think it was Jerry Royce you were talking <laughs> no, I didn't. What? And he, Steve Carl neither. He, they're both, <laughs> they're both, they got jobs. The lefty's 32. Yeah, right. No, that's right with Royce is 41, yeah. Oh, one pitch is high. So it's one and one to Mike Dunn. I think if you're Hernandez and Johnson, you could be you'd be more inclined to just take the bunt totally away from Dunn because he's not the type of pitcher you wouldn't think that would bunt show bunt and then swing away. Not that experienced in the major no. leagues. And the bunt is a good one. Good to second. Safe at second. Safe at first. Well, there was a mistake right there by Dwight Gooden. You got to make sure of the one out, and this play was not close at second. Got to know who's running at first, and I blame Gary Carter. It's a catcher's call. This bunt is not a good bunt, but it's not that bad, and Gooden makes the late throw to second. They miss him there, and of course, don't get an out. So now the time run is on with no one out, and you have the top of the batting order coming up. You want to make sure you get an out when you got right. a lead in this spot got a two-run lead that's well put and if you get one out even a base hit's going to put you one run up so poor judgment on the part of Carter and good 
lead to two men on and nobody out. Barry Bonds 0 for 1. He struck out to lead off the game. The reason why the catcher calls that play is he can see what's happening. He's facing the action where the pitcher who fielded the ball is not. Her ball is low, 1 and 0. Oh. Well, I'll tell you, patterns are so important in baseball. Talked about the pattern last inning. Good in striking out Lavalier. That's changed a great deal here in the third. Two on and nobody out. Popped up left side. Wilson on. It could be playable. Mookie makes the catch. Mookie Wilson goes almost into the stands to make it a catch that few left fielders would have made. One out. Wow, what a play. Well, Mookie, of course, has the speed to get to it, but it's still not an easy play because he has the fence to worry about. Comes over here, looks, and then stays with it. And he almost dropped that ball. He got it on the second pop out of the glove. Look at this play again. That Four. little ledge on the bottom of the outfield fence, you can see that little ledge. Mookie knew, obviously knew it was there, and used that for leverage. Boy, that was a fine play by Mookie Wilson. Here's Van Slyke. He knew that fence was somewhere, and fortunately for Mookie, he didn't get hurt. When you run that far, it's really tough to make that play. Looks like there are 100 baseballs coming down. Oh, it? you're looking up. You've you got to have an eye on the, on the fence, and now you're watching the ball. You know the fence is there, and he gets the backhand job on it. And it hits the heel of the glove and goes into the web. Good, good play. Came off that little ledge, saying, piece of cake, had it all the way, right? <laughs> one out, two on, two nothing New York. Strike one. I don't think Mookie would know, but he should give a special thank you to, was it Harry Latina? who designed the glove that is now being used. He was the one that really put the thought into the type of gloves that you see being manufactured all over the world. I thought maybe he designed that ledge Mookie, <laughs> Mookie stood on. Fastball is low, one and one. Now that was uh, Fred Wilpon. <laughs> They're gonna have a big day in Brooklyn tomorrow, honoring the old Brooklyn Dodgers, the old timers. And you know, I'm going to, you won't believe this, Tim. I'm going to go into the Brooklyn Hall of Fame, and I never played for Brooklyn. Was I that bad a player? No, I you were that, that, that good a player as a visiting player. Is Musial going in, too? Yeah, he's got <laughs> to go in there. He used to wear that Ebbets Field out. Lifetime over, five, over 400 in Ebbets Field. As a matter of fact, that's where Stan got the name The Man. All the Brooklynites used to say, look at that man hit. The man can hit. He used to tattoo that right field fence with regularity. Hit a few others, too. One and two to Andy Van Slyke. Andy entered the game betting 257. He's been a hot batter. Two doubles, two home runs, seven runs batted in in his last six ball games. And not a bad trade for the Pirates. They got two starters starting tonight and a starting pitcher tonight. So three of the nine players obtained in the Tony Pena trade. Foul tip off the right foot of Gary Carter. So still one and two. Here's the pitch, and it's a high fastball, and Vance like got on top of it and oh. fouled it down on Carter's foot. Fortunately, it's the one that isn't bruised up. His other foot is the one that has all the bruises. Now he's got two feet that are evened up. into another pattern of signs. Pretty well hit the right field. Playable. Strawberry coming on, and he can't get to it. Darrell Strawberry came a long way to try to get to that little humpback liner, and it dropped right in front of him. It looked like he didn't pick the ball up immediately. 
Oh, first base hit off Gooden, and it's a blue pit into right field. Strawberry from a deep position, and Wright just can't catch up to it even with his speed. Runners had to hold up to see whether or not he was going to catch it, so they can only move up one base. That will load up the bases as Strawberry picks it up on the one bounce. So the batter will be Johnny Ray. Very difficult hitter to, to strike out, and he runs fairly well. So a dangerous situation for good, and the base is loaded and one out. That ball was not hit very high, so Strawberry, even though he didn't pick it up right away, would have had a difficult chance, even if he had had a good jump on that ball. Well, it's twilight time, and it's hard to pick the yep. ball up when you don't have the lights in full effect. And still some twilight that makes it very difficult to pick the ball. Ray grounded the second his first time up. Backman in double play. Depth cheating towards second. Foul ball, 0-1. See the blurred background there. You guess you got to think that good. That's what Gooden is looking at. Faceless heads on nameless walls. That's always the case of players. When you look up at the stands, it's tough to decipher faces. But I would imagine certainly that way tonight for good. How many people have said to you, didn't you see me waving at you in the stands? How come he didn't wave back? Oh, I remember you, the guy in the pink shirt. Fly ball, left field. Should be deep enough to score. And speaking of the twilight time, Wilson lost the ball. Belliard scores, but an alert Dykstra keeps it from being very damaging. Mookie lost it. Well, it's easy to do. We brought it up on the ball hit. Not Strawberry's way. You can lose the ball this time of night because of the twilight. And Mookie totally lost the ball. He started after it. Now here he loses it. He doesn't know where it is. He calls for Dykstra and Wally and Len Dykstra over there to make the play. Good job by Dykstra backing up Mookie Wilson. Mookie finally did see it, but it was Dykstra's ball then. Boy, a fine alert play by Dykstra. So two good plays, one by Wilson on the foul ball hit by Bonds, and now Dykstra alertly covering for Mookie. So there are two outs. Belliard scored. Sacrifice fly for Ray, and Sid Bream fouls back the high fastball. Or Johnny Ray, RBI number 29 on the year. That technically should have been the third out. But the poor judgment used by Carter and Gooden on the bunt play keeps the inning alive for the Pirates and plates them a run. That's the importance of getting that sure out on the bunt. Line drive, left center, well hit. Dykstra. Oh, boy. Dykstra and Wilson collide. Bream's going to keep running. We don't know whether the ball was caught or not. Bream's going to try to score, but it wasn't out. The ball was caught for the third out. Otherwise, it's an inside the park home run. And a greater concern is whether Dykstra and or Wilson are hurt. And again, the twilight had to have come into play. Oh, boy. Oh, here it is again. Dykstra and Mookie Wilson converging. And oh. Mookie gets his glove on the ball and holds on to it as they collide, and he goes down to the ground. It would have been a three-run home run if the ball had not stayed in the glove. Oh, boy, what a play and what a collision. And it appears that they're going to be able to come off the field under their own power. This could be very, very serious. Oh, oh, oh. man. That's oh. really a total collision there. How did Mookie hold on to that ball? Boy, shades of Adrian Dantley the other night in game seven of the Celtics and Detroit Pistons when Dantley suffered a concussion. Thankfully, they appear to be able to walk off under their own power. 
Both look like they got facial cuts. There's a bloody nose for Dykstra. Well, the Pirates score a run. And after two and a half, it's two to one New York. And we will try to have a report for you after this word from Ford. We'll be right back. Right now, the news from Ford is great value. Tempo, Ford's popular aerodynamic sedan, is now available with 3.9% financing or 600 cash back. Add the cash back to an option. Proud to introduce the all-new Junior Mets Club, now open for membership to Mets fans 14 and under. And it appears that both Mookie and Dangster are cut up, but all right. And back to the members, they will receive exclusive club items, including color action baseball cards, a pro-style batting glove, discount ticket coupons for special Junior Mets Club games, and invitation to a Junior Mets baseball clinic at Shea Plus, much more. The join sends $6 or $5 plus two proof of purchases from Farmland Dairies Milk to Junior Mets Club, Shea Stadium, Flushing, New York, 11368. Please include your name, address, telephone number, and age, and allow four to six weeks delivery. Also, the Mets and the Phillies, Sunday, June 21st, 135, and of course, it's Father's Day. All men, 15 and over, will receive a specially designed shaving kit featuring the Mets World Championship logo, courtesy of Ivory Soap. Tickets are available at all Ticketron outlets at Shea Stadium's advanced ticket window, or you can call 718-507-TIXX. Well, I tell you, I don't know whether the Mets are snake bit or not, but after that collision, and this is the collision right here, I'll tell you what we saw between innings. Ooh, frightening. Boy, head-to-head -head contact right there. Mookie catching the ball and holding on to it as he goes down to the ground. Here's Wally Backman to lead off the bottom of the third, and he taps one towards second. Johnny Ray throws him out, one away. It's 2-1 New York. Anyway, as Wilson and Dykstra were coming off the field, Sam Palazzo, the third base coach, waited to see if they were all right. They appear to be, but we'll try to find out for you. And as Palazzo was going to the third base coach's box, Mike Dunn, the pitcher, uncorked a wild pitch warming up and it hit Palazzo. All sorts of things are happening to this Mets ball club and here it is only June 5th. There's Sam. I believe it hit him in his left shoulder. He appears to be all right. How about the three outs by the Mets outfielders in the third inning? Mookie with two spectacular catches and Dykes recovering for Mookie as you look at him and Mookie evidently jarred those teeth he appears to be okay they might be a little loose but he's gonna stay in there Hernandez on on an error his first time up it's two and oh to keep each side with one hit two to one New York and it's two and one to Hernandez Keith with a great May going himself back into that 300 hitters class hit 310 last year 309 the year before all three three and one in the 1973 playoffs or was it the World Series the right fielder of the Mets Rusty Staub hammered the right center field fence hurt his left shoulder it was the playoffs all right this one tapped foul three and two to Keith it was Rusty's right shoulder Rusty standing behind ready to come in in the fourth inning he says it still hurts I understand that <laughs> mine was never hurt but it still hurts he crashed into the fence in right field to make a great catch and then in the World Series couldn't throw but he played anyway what a series he has Hernandez walks that's the third walk issued by Mike Dunn the catcher but that collision of Dykstra and Wilson in left center field reminiscent of another great Met outfielder who had a collision with an inanimate object. Those fences don't give much. Jerry Carter the batter. Jerry walked his first at bat. A little tapper and it's foul 0-1. Was it Blocker and Dykstra that ran together two Dy years Dykstra ago? Dykstra and Danny Heap two years ago on a ball hit by Terry Pendleton 
an inside the park grand slam home run. Ground ball to third, could be two. Morrison, Ray. For the 11th time this year, Gary Carter grounds into a double play. No runs, no hits, no errors, and none left. And as we promised, Rusty joins Ralph after this word from Budweiser. Bud Thunder is revved up and coming. Well, we're going now to the top of the fourth and stepping in to join me, Rusty Stop. Hey, Rusty, we were talking, I guess you did hear us about that time you ran into the fence in right field in the playoffs against the Cincinnati Reds where the Mets big underdogs defeated Cincinnati and went on to the World Series. It was a great series. I think everyone felt that uh, especially after the opening win a tough win Tom Seaver had given up a home run in the bottom of the ninth to Johnny Bench. Everybody wrote the New York Mets off. Obviously in baseball you cannot do that. So we're going to the top of the fourth inning the Mets leading two to one and the leadoff batter for the Pirates Jim Morrison. We were talking about the collision between Danny Heap and Terry Blocker. That took place on June 9th, 1985. Knocked Blocker right out of the major leagues. And the first pitch is ball one as Jim Morrison takes for a 1 0 count. Morrison flying out the left his first time up. And the curveball missing. 2-0. One of the worst collisions I've ever seen, Ralph, was George Theodore and Don Hahn colliding in left field at Shea Stadium. I believe that might have been uh, in 74-73. I'm not sure which year it was, but George Theodore wound up with a broken hip. It was really terrible. George Theodore was once... He was called a stork, and they once said he looked like a man who was put together by a committee. <laughs> He could swing the bat, though. Good hitter, good RBI man. Yes, he was all through his minor league career. Didn't have a long major league career, but certainly was uh, very well liked amongst his teammates. And the 3 0 fastball, a strike, 3 and 1. Mets leading 2 to 1, both sides with a base hit. And the fastball hit down to third. Good play by Howard Johnson. And Morrison is out. Ball was not hit too hard, and that made it a tougher play. It looked like it was hit hard. Howard Johnson going down on one knee, catching the short hop. Comes up and has an easy play now. But you're right, Ralph. Some of those balls, when you right think field. it's a rope and that hot corner, it's almost like an outfielder in center field when the ball is hit off the end of the bat. He doesn't realize that it's not a hard hit ball, and it's, that's his toughest play for the third baseman. Same thing. Now the batter R.J. Reynolds and Reynolds takes for ball one. Reynolds walked in a 3-2 pitch his first time up. The first base runner off Dwight Gooden. Gooden has struck out two. And he has walked two. One ball, one strike to count to R.J. Reynolds. I think that's the reason why Howard Johnson on that play wound up on his knees. It kind of fooled him. Use the sound of the bat to tell you something about what the ball might be doing and sometimes that sound will throw you off. One and one the count and the fastball of strike one and two. You see the right field ball girl Stacy retrieving a beach ball out there. She's called the Grand Orlage of right field. <laughs> Fastball a good one just did miss. Two balls, two strikes, and some movement on that pitch. She can probably outrun me right now, Ralph. Maybe my earlier years I had her. <laughs> Been a close race. Oh, <laughs> Timey with the one pot of the, the kettle black here, huh? Timey with an egg time. Yeah. The Salons of time. Good curve, but hanging a little bit high. And it goes to three and two. One hit off to White Gooden, a blue hit by Andy Van Slyke that dropped just in front of Daryl Strawberry. Again the curve, and again it hangs high. So R.J. Reynolds walked, and that'll bring up Mike Lavalier. This game is brought to you in part by R.C. Cola. People go out of their way for the taste of R.C. And by New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut Lincoln Mercury Mercur dealers. 
catcher, Mike Lavalier. Lavalier called out on strikes with a runner in scoring position his first time up. Gooden got him with a curve on a 3-2 count. And the fastball a strike. has been doing such an excellent job behind the plate. I'm sure he's creating problems for Jim Leland as far as the whether he's going to keep pl platooning. He's almost thrown out 50% of the runners trying to steal second base. Got one in tonight's ball game. And he's done a good job with the bat hitting 300. And the fastball foul back strike two. Two for nine against the Mets this year. Earlier in the ballgame, we had some comparative figures on Gooden's third year as compared to the other pitchers that have been outstanding pitchers in baseball. Gooden ranked right at the top. And this ball fouled away. But Gooden has some work cut out if he's going to duplicate Bob Feller, whom I think was the best pitcher that I ever saw. Feller at his fourth year was 24 and 9 with 246 strikeouts. His fifth year he was 27 and 11 with 261 Ks. And his next year he was 25 and 13. And then he went in the service for a long period of time and lost some real protective years. When he got out of the service, he again was a 20 game winner. A lot of hitters like that service time he put in. I know that. Mm. Feller as a 22-year-old in 1941, 125 and lost 13, struck out 260 batters, pitched six shutouts. Rapid Robert. And the pitch out, Nuthy Dog. One and two the count. A good base runner would have picked that up on Dwight Gooden. He gave that away when he delivered the ball to the plate so lackadaisically. Not that it was lackadaisical. It's just that he didn't follow his true rhythm. Didn't stay in that working pattern. Got a little to, rushed. Right. You have to kind of keep that same delivery and just deliver it quickly. You know, a little bit on the high side on the outside part of the plate. Give that catcher a good chance to get a run and start out of there. R.J. Reynolds at first base. He is a threat to run. Another pitch out, and Reynolds holds at first base. Gave a good fake at running, but then did not go. Wisely he, so. He's, he's stolen three out of four bases. He did give a little run, as you said, Ralph. He's three for four. I'm not such a, a big believer in pitch outs like that. That's not my decision, though. And a fly ball to left field. Mookie Wilson right there, and he makes the catch. Reynolds back to first base. He was not running on the pitch. And now with two men out, the batter will be the shortstop, shortstop. Raphael Belliar. One of the things Dwight Gooden did in his second year, and a little bit even in his first year, was he found a way with real good base runners on first base to deliver the ball just a little bit quicker and not take away from his effectiveness. He stopped doing that. I don't know why. Uh, I do think every pitcher in the big leagues, especially, especially as much as running is part of the game now, should have a shorter delivery when the best runners are on first base because you just can't let guys keep stealing bases on you all the time. Of course, power pitchers have a tough time speeding up their delivery. They depend on their legs so much. They will never learn how to do it if they don't work on it. Right. I think that's my point. Well, he did improve his move tremendously from his first year. Of course, when he pitched in the minors and in high school, he didn't have to have a good move. Nobody got on. Got him. Got him. Goodbye. Got him moving toward second and picked him off. That ends the inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, a walk, a man picked off, no one left on. The score at the end of three and a half innings, the Mets two and the Pirates one. Now here's a word from R.C. Cola. The Daily Show and Mookie Wilson collided in the outfield, both they hit face to face and both got 
cut up, and right there, some work being done on Lenny Dykstra. Looks like he might have had a fight. Here's R.J. Reynolds. Oop, the bad move. He turned in his good quick tag. Good move by Dwight Gooden to first base. You were talking, Rusty, about speeding delivery to home plate. And it, it is very, very important because you get that ball up there in a hurry. Dwight did it during that one period. It, I agree with you, Ralph, that power pitches shouldn't affect themselves too much. But when he had success with it, he went away from it. But all the other pitchers that are not power pitchers certainly should be working on that. And as you see, a ball down in the way to Darryl Strawberry. Uh, that has not been worked on enough, I don't think. Well, Ed Lynch did it to perfection. He really helped his guy. There's no doubt it helped Eddie Lynch. And a good splitter there, and it's one ball and one strike. Strawberry hitting for the second time, grounded into a force play, actually a fielder's choice, as the ball was thrown away and dropped at shortstop, covering that second. That's got two runs in the first without a base hit. There were two errors by the Pirates that led to two unearned runs. They only hit Dykstra's single to right. And now the count goes to three and one on Strawberry. Strawberry has had 22 walks in his last 17 ball games. Topped out foul, so it'll be three and two. This this evening, everyone's attention is obviously on Dwight Gooden. I would say that this has not been the the most opportune moment for Mike Dunn to get a start his <laughs> first start in the big leagues a packed house in New York against Dwight Gooden coming out for the first time he's handled himself pretty well Ralph very well given up only one hit kept his poise and this ball drilled on the left field line it's foul so strawberry back and the count stays at three balls and two strikes National League scoreboard here. Nissan National League scoreboard. A final. The Cardinals over the Cubs 5 to 1. In the fourth inning, all tied Expos in Philadelphia. In the fifth, 3 to 1. The kind of San Diego got front there. Yeah. We got a 5 to nothing or a 6 to nothing LA at Cincinnati. And the Giants and the Astros 1 to nothing in the top of the second. So Strawberry walks. And that is his. 23rd walk in his last 18 ball games, and the Mets have their leadoff batter on base for the first time in this ball game. And Mookie Wilson is a batter. Mookie got an RBI when he grounded into a force play his first time up. And the fastball for ball one. Mookie hitting the Pirates well. He's had nine hits and 18 at bats. That's 500. And a throw to first strawberry back. Darrell with 11 stolen bases and 15 attempts. He is the club leader in that department. Again, he gets back. Ralph J. Horowitz just came in with a report on Lenny Dystra and Mookie Wilson. Mookie had a couple of cuts in his mouth, nothing heavy. And Dystra had a superficial cut on his nose. That's what we saw on the camera. As you see, another attempted pickoff of Darryl Strawberry. They collided face to face on a ball that was caught by Mookie Wilson. How he caught it and held on to it, I don't know. Would, would have been an inside the park three run home run. Certainly would have been. And Dystra had his mouth open wide on that play. He's lucky he didn't get hurt worse. yelling balk here on the step off of the pitcher's rubber. One balk has been called on Dunn so far in this game. Chopped out toward third. They'll get a play at first base and that's all as Strawberry moves on down to second. That's a play where Sid Bream Strawberry got a good jump on a slow hit ball. All he saw was Darryl Strawberry's back on this play. See the ball really high in the air. He takes a real chance if he throws the second base, so he takes the sure out. Here's Strawberry, going to get a good jump. He knows he's got to move. Stays up high, comes in. And that kind of play, you want to stay up high kind of late. You don't want to slide early or dive in. You want to give yourself the, the widest, you know, visual thing you can give that first baseman so it, it looks like he's not going to throw the second base. And if he does, though, you want it to hit you. Definitely. So you try to keep a big target out there, trying to block out the shortstop covering or the second baseman covering, whoever it might be. 
left-handed first baseman have an advantage because they are on the inside. Keith Hernandez probably makes that play as good as anybody. He scares you half the time, but he seems to get the throw there all the time. And Howard Johnson grounds a first pitch foul. He makes some of the gutsiest throws to second base of any first baseman I've ever seen. We all know about his abilities, but his judgment has just been incredible. You're watching Mets Baseball 87 on WWOR TV, Secaucus, New Jersey. Mets leading two to one, a runner in scoring position, one out, bottom half of the fourth. And this ball popped up. Larry Bonds in left field, and he makes the play one, two men away. Strawberry holds at second base. Yankee bad news here. Placed Henderson on the 15-day disabled list. He pulled his right hamstring. And he has returned back to New York due to back spasms. So the Yankees experienced a little physical problems themselves in 1987. That'll bring up Rafael Santana. Santana broke his bat and popped up to short his first time up. The club is really amazing is the St. Louis Cardinals. They haven't had their regular lineup in the ballgame going back to last year. They're 32 and 19, three games up in the Cubs in first place. And Santana for the count of one and all. You have to give credit where credit's due. I think Jack Clark's explosive month is probably the biggest reason why they have one, but they've had a lot of guys. McGrain came in. He's on the disabled list now, but he came in and racked up three or four wins right in a row. And again, the fastball two and all. Todd Borrell has been doing a great job in their bullpen. He had a shaky start in the first three weeks, four weeks of the season. He already had a save. Now has 13 saves and is tied for the league lead. And ball three, three and oh to Rafael Santana. The on-deck batter, Dwight Good. Santana won't see anything good here. Well, he certainly is going to pitch around him a little bit. They're going to put him on. So it will go as an intentional walk. And it puts runners at first and second and brings up Dwight Good. Here's the next pitcher. Fifth walk of the game. Good. Issued by Mike Dunn. Good and grounded out his first appearance. Pirates set up playing Dwight Gooden over toward right field, giving him a little bit of room in right field. Center field playing in a little bit. In this situation, you could challenge a little bit to try to throw the runner out. And Gooden goes after the fastball strike one. As a defensive outfield, at a certain situations, Dwight Gooden does have some pop, but you have to challenge in certain situations. Pirates are down two to one. This is one of the times where I think particularly a right fielder could take advantage of this a little bit by playing it a little shallower. Did he swing? Checking the swing. And no appeal, so it goes as a ball. One ball, one strike. The outfielders at this time have to check the base runners. They see Santana at first and Strawberry at second, so if it's a, not a really hard hit ball to the outfield, the idea is to try to throw the ball to third base and get Santana. This ball fouled to the right side out of play. But if the ball is hit hard right at an outfielder now, if he is challenging, gets a good pickup on the ball, gives him a chance to throw the runner out at the plate. You got to pre-think these things if you're going to really be successful. You have to know if it's not hit hard, what to do. If it's hit hard, what to do. All the preparedness is taken before the pitch is made. leading two to one two men out bottom half of the fourth each side with a base hit done checking on the count was confused and ball two two and two the count Mike Dunn spells his name D-U-N-N-E making his first major league start. 24 years of age. Fastball grounded in the hole and a good play by Belliard. He goes to second for the force and that'll do it. 
No runs, no hits, two walks, two left, and the score at the end of four, the Mets two and the Pirates one. Now, here's a word from the good old guy. The Major League debut of Dwight Gooden, and so far, the Mets are leading by a score two to one. We're going to the top of the fifth inning, and it will be Raphael Belliard to resume his time at bat. He was left at home plate when R.J. Reynolds was picked off at first to end the inning in the fourth. Belliard walked his first time up and has scored the only powered run. It was driven in by Johnny Ray and the sacrifice fly to center field. And Gooden's fastball for ball one. Here's the totals on one through four for Dwight Gooden tonight. They are impressive. And the fastball for ball two. Two balls, no strikes. Gooden has struck out two, and he has walked three. And a strike call. Missed with a fastball. So good and behind the eighth place hitter with the on deck batter Mike Dunn, the pitcher. Strike call. Well, kind of somber at this moment. Never lost to the Pirates. He's 6 and 0 against them. It was 2 and 0 last year. The Mets have won four of the five games played with Pittsburgh this year. Last year they won 17 of the 18 against the Pirates. And again a foul ball. The one win that Pittsburgh had this year against the Mets stopped a string of 15 consecutive wins by the Mets over the Pirates. It was the Pirates that caused the Mets so many problems in 1985. The Mets were striving for their Eastern Division Championship, which the Cardinals won. The Pirates probably gave them more trouble than anybody. And again, a fastball fouled off. What a difference a year made. The Pirates were totally dominated in 1986 by the Mets. But I do think Ralph, that the Pirates are moving in the right direction. I think they have some fine young players, some fine young pitchers, and that there's light at the end of the tunnel in Pittsburgh. It is there. Of course, that light could be the oncoming rushing of a train. Well, I think they're going in the right direction. And this one hit in the air to right. Strawberry playing over near the line has an easy play. Nissan American League scoreboard and the fourth end. The Blue Jays ahead of the Orioles, four to one, two to nothing. The Tigers over the, over Boston in the fifth inning. In the second inning, Yankees one, Brewers zero. It's in Milwaukee. In the fourth inning, five to nothing. The Rangers in Minnesota losing, or the Rangers are ahead five to nothing. You see the White Sox, Angels, Indians, Athletics, and Royals, Mariners are all later tonight. Now the batter will be the pitcher Mike Dunn, and Dunn takes a strike. Dunn. Bunted his first time up, and the Mets allowed him to reach when they tried for the force play on the bunt at second. That set it up for the Pirates to score one run. That's strike two. That's what we were talking about, Ralph, knowing your base runners. Belliard, obviously a fast runner, gets a good jump, certainly got a good jump on that, beat Dwight Gooden. Or beat his throw to second base, anyway. And that pitch was close. One and two, the count to Mike Dunn, batting for the first time in the major leagues. His first time up, back in the third inning. Now his second at bat. And this ball fouled back out of play. As you watch Gooden work in his first game this year, you wonder how far he will go. I doubt that if the score stays this way, he will go all the way. 
The longest he has pitched this year is seven innings. His last time out, he went six innings. Gave up one hit and struck out ten. And then the curveball. You see the keys. Right good was third strikeout. It's going to be another good, as you called it, Ralph. A Lord Charles right on the outside part of the plate. Excellent pitch. You can bet they're counting his pitches in the dugout. Pitching coach Mel Stottlemyre. Keeping very abreast of the number of pitches that Dwight Gooden is throwing. I think Davey Johnson will make that decision as they go along, counting the pitchers, seeing how he is throwing. Might even be checking his velocity. Joey Fitzgerald behind the plate with the gun, checking velocity on all pitches, especially on the home games. Can give that information to manager Davey Johnson. And Barry Bonds takes a fastball, strike one. Bonds, the first man that Gooden faced this year, and he struck him out. Started off with a bang. One ball, one strike. Again, the fastball. Got to be a thrill to come back and strike out your first man after all the controversy, all the delay. Well, I think as much as that was a, an edge for him, just getting a, a victory and being part of a victory for the New York Mets will probably make Dwight Gooden feel as good as anything, knowing that he's back with his teammates. And contributing. That's it, contributing. Good fastball there. It's one and two. Mons does a lot of this. He certainly does. It's not something that's good for a young player to do. Pitch right on the inside corner at the knees. the curveball and the count two and two he really didn't give the umpire much grief on that more was in disgust for himself my reference was basically I don't think any young player much any old player should be getting on the umpires if he expects to be around and and have any kind of benefit as you see a fly ball deep to Mookie Wilson so the Pirates go in order Gooden has retired four in a row since his walk to R.J. Reynolds and the score at the end of four and a half innings. The Mets two and the Pirates one. Now here's a word from Budweiser. Seven people. Bottom half of the fifth Thanks. inning. The Mets leading two to one and for the Mets it'll be Lenny Dykstra to lead it off. Dykstra with the only hit of Mike Dunn. Lenny singled the right field in the second after striking out his first time up. And a hard ground ball on by Belliard in the left center field. Barry Mons gets it back in in a hurry, and Dykstra has the two hits for the New York Mets in this game. Second baseman, Wally. Barry Dykstra struggled in the earlier part of the year against the Pirates. You're going to see a shot. Ball just scoots right by Belliard. He didn't exactly make a great effort at that ball. I agree with the, with the hit, but Belliard did not give it what you would call the a gutsy try. So that brings up Wally Backman, a gutsy ball player. Backman has walked. He also has scored, and he has grounded out. So he's 0 for 1. Delior looked like he was thinking about the wife and the kids on that one, Ralph. Little hole there. <laughs> and they have a play at second base. The throw is in time for the force play, as Backman is unable to sacrifice. Good play by Dunn, the pitcher. It is a good aggressive play of nothing else, but uh, he executes tremendously well. Makes a good throw way ahead of Dystra. For a young pitcher to make a, an aggressive play like that, I think that's uh, a real show of, of poise. Good poise. So back when now at first plate, first base, and the batter will be Keith Hernandez. Keith for one with a walk in this game was on base on an error by Morrison in the first a play that helped set it up for the Mets to score their two runs a lot of times when you're bunting as Wally Backman was there you're in a hurry to get out of the batter's box and you kind of start moving toward first I think that cost him there because he had a reach for that ball and that's why he didn't get it by the pitcher and a pitch out but nothing on there's a fine line between bunting and running and when you should do it. That 
down was more a base hit type bunt than it was a sacrifice. Definitely it was. And that's what I'm saying. He got out of the box. He was thinking a little bit too much about running instead of bunting first, bringing it with him. The ball kind of tailed away from him, and he was he was already moving toward first base, had to reach out, and did not get the ball by the pitcher. Matty Alou was probably the best bunter I think I've ever seen as far as being able to control what he wanted to do as the pitch came in. There goes Backman. The ball swung on and missed the throw in plenty of time. And Backman is out. The hit and run was on, and a tough pitch for Hernandez to make contact. And Lavalier throws him out. And Lavalier makes a fine play on a ball down. You see a good, quick release and an excellent throw right there. No chance for Wally Backman because that was a hit and run. He picks up the runner, I mean, picks up the hitter. But it's just too good a throw, too quick a release by Lavalier, and Backman's out. And now Keith misses again in the count one and two. Mets leading two to one, two men out, bottom half of the fifth inning. Andy Van Slyke playing about as deep as I've seen anybody play Keith Hernandez in center field. This ball ripped to right, but R.J. Reynolds is there, and that will do it. So the Mets get a hit, but lose the runner and leave no one on. And the score at the end of five, as Steve Zabriskie joins Rusty Stop, it's the New York Mets two, and the Pirates one. Now here's a word from Nissan. And two to one, the Mets, Dwight Gooden on the mound, and Steve Zabriskie in to do the play-by-play. -play. Thanks a lot, Russ. And Dwight, as you see, has been clocked anywhere between 73 and 92 miles an hour so far tonight as Andy Van Slyke leads off the sixth and takes that big Lord Charles for strike one. Van Slyke has popped out the Howard Johnson in foul territory and singled the right, one for two. Another breaking ball is when just missed. We talked about Andy Van Slyke moving the center field since the move took place. Going into this game, he was 9 for 21 with 7 RBI, so the move seems to have helped Andy Van Slyke in an offensive way. Good fastball. One ball, two strikes. I think anybody that does move the center field, we talked about how deep Andy Van Slyke was playing. When you're a right fielder, you move the center field, I think the first tendency is to play a little deep. That's not his normal position. Well, he is a good enough outfielder, however, to play it and play it well. Breaking ball grounded foul outside first, and the count remains one and two. One of the reasons the Pirates moved Andy Van Slyke to center field is that Jim Leland was very concerned about the lack of proper communication among his outfielders. And it, I guess it really comes into play tonight with Mookie Wilson and Lenny Dykstra crashing together in left center. But Jim Leland, and whom you see right there, felt that the outfield wasn't playing well enough together, so he moved Bonds to left from center, R.J. Reynolds over to right from left, and Van Slyke to center, because Van Slyke is capable of playing there, in an effort to improve the situation out there. Just inside, two and two. And I guess part of that has to do with the inexperience of, uh, inexperience of Barry Bonds, because the other outfielders generally play off the center fielder. I guess Leland hopes that Van Slyke's additional experience will help the entire outfield. Popped up in foul territory and drifting out of play. Howard Johnson with a look at it up on the tarp. And the count remains two and two. Not as an excuse, but as an explanation of why Mookie Wilson and Lenny Dystra have had some problems communicating with each other. It's very difficult. For Mookie Wilson, having been a center fielder for so many years and had everybody playing off of him, moving the left field, it's been tough for him to adjust to playing off the center field. Plus, Mookie feels that when he goes after a ball, he should get everything. Strikeout number four for the doctor. And one out here in the sixth yeah, inning. Second baseman. Van Slyke just gets beat Ray. right here. Doc, good fast ball down and away. Good strike. There's only one thing you can do in that case, tote that lumber back. Tote it on back, and Van Slyke did just that. Three of the four strikeouts Gooden has recorded have been called, and here's the tough guy to strike out, Johnny Ray. The fastball outside for ball one. Ray is 0 for 1. He grounded a second and drove in the Pirates' only run in the third with a sacrifice fly. The 
It was actually to left, but it was caught by the center fielder. Uh, Johnny Ray's hitting 264, and I think he's going through that syndrome of a guy who has always been called on to get on base, being put in a position to have to drive in runs. This one's out of play, and the count now one and one. I think that's one of the things that is not an easy adjustment. Johnny Ray, a guy who scores a lot of runs, does a lot of things with the bat, moves the ball behind the runner, hit and run. All of a sudden, he's called upon to be the three-hole hitter and be the key man to drive and runs along with Sid Bream in this lineup. And it's not that easy adjustment for a guy who has always been called upon to get on base. There's a changeup from the doctor. One ball, two strikes. That's about the sixth or seventh changeup Mike Gooden has thrown today. Most of them excellent pitches. That is a pitch the doctor's worked on the last few years and has not been effective for him up until this point. Breaking ball grounded foul, and the count remains one and two. Well, you know how much I talk about that changeup. I, I love it. I think that's the, the lost pitch. Uh, you know, the split-fingered fastball is a great pitch, and a lot of people are having tremendous success with it. I'm not against it, but I'll tell you what. A good pitcher with a good changeup, a guy that has some velocity, good straight changeup, it's a great pitch, as you see Rick Aguilera working on his split-fingered fastball. <laughs> good shot, Billy Webb. Stretching those fingers. In his inactivity, you do have to keep those fingers stretched. Breaking ball popped up behind second. Santana calls for it, makes the catch, two away. The problems that the Pirates have been having, and of course you alluded to Johnny Ray in that number three spot, having to make the adjustment. The reason the Pirates have fallen on some hard times, at least one of the major reasons, has to do with their three, four, and five hitters. Sid Bream hitting fourth and 0 for 2 tonight. Of their three, four, and five hitters, Johnny Ray, Sid Bream, and Jim Morrison, they have not had a home run in the last 150 at-bats collectively coming into this game tonight. And there's a strike to Breen. And Steve, speaking of those three hitters, and that's the meat of their lineup. They were 15 for 81 coming into this game. 185. That's actually not coming into this game. That was through Tuesday night. On Wednesday night, they had a good night. In fact, Morrison went four for four. There's a base hit, a line shot in the center field. Only the second pirate hit. And it comes with two out here in the sixth inning. You cannot, you cannot have your three, four, five slot hit like that. Good shot of Sid Bream here. Gooden's fastball. Bream a fastball. He doesn't try to come off that ball. You saw he stayed on that ball real well. Went right back through the middle. That's an excellent swing. The ball was tailing away. A good velocity fastball. You can't try to pull all those pitches. He didn't, and he hit it well. So with two out and Bream at first base, here's Jim Morrison, who is 0 for 2 and 1 for 20. Career against Doc Gooden. Breaking ball stays high, ball one. As we said, that 3-4-5 slot has been struggling. Wednesday night, Morrison went four for four. Still having his troubles against Dwight Gooden. Morrison has had two seasons over the last two months, two different types of seasons. Pops this one up. Santana again calling for it. And the inning is over. One hit and one left for the Pirates here in the sixth inning. And after five and a half, it's still New York two, Pittsburgh one. We're back after this for Lincoln Mercury. Former Mets, catcher Gary Parker. Steve Zabriskie and Rusty Stahm back here with you at Shea Stadium where the doctor is the story tonight, but he's found himself in a ball game, Russ, because Mike Dunn has pitched very well. He certainly has. He's had a few walks, but uh, a lot of poise by the young man. I, I think they should be paying attention probably as far as Dwight Gooden is concerned. Uh, they, they should be checking with the gun and making sure that his velocity is good, talking to him. Uh, you know, they'd like to see him go as far as he can as you see a ball inside from Dunn to Carter. Uh, a lot of things should be happening in that dugout right now as far as conversations with Dwight Gooden. And I'm sure they are. Carter with a ground ball back up the middle for a base hit into center field. So Gary is now one for two plus a walk as he leads off the sixth for New York. And the Mets leading two to one. Keep waiting to see Gary Carter get hot. It's going to happen. And Great I think it's going to happen soon. There's a few sick people right there with the Bill Webb fan club. Now that's a professionally made sign. You know, you know Bill paid for them. You know he had to. 
Here's Daryl Strawberry. 0 for 1 plus a walk. Daryl drove in a run with a ground out. Reaching on a fielder's choice in the first inning. As I was saying about Gary Carter, Gary Carter's got to do more of what you just saw. Now that ball wasn't a bullet through the middle, but it was a good firm ground ball through the middle. He's going to have to move the ball more through the middle to get out of this thing and stop coming off the ball. That's how you get out of a slump. Breaking ball, a strike call to Daryl Strawberry, who didn't agree with Billy Williams. The Mets now with three hits, and the Pirates have managed only two off Dwight. Gary Carter has had some spurts as of late where he has swung the bat well. Most of the time when he's gone, it looks like back through the middle with the pitcher, staying on the ball. Outside, one and one. Just been told by Billy Webb that Dwight Gooden has thrown 90 pitches so far. So I'm sure they're winging that in the dugout. Down low, two and one. Strawberry has walked 23 times now in the last 19 games with his walk in the fourth inning. There is some activity in the Pirate bullpen, but none in the Met bullpen. Just outside, three and one now. Dorn Taylor, the young right-hander throwing. I think if you see Gary Carter get hot, especially if he's back in the sixth slot, if Kevin McReynolds is put in the fourth slot, and you see Strawberry take a big rip on a fastball down on the way. I think you'll see Darryl Strawberry getting better pitches to hit. Here's another shot of that. Good fastball. Dunn put everything he had in it. Almost looked like he was falling off the mound. Strawberry, good swing. Stayed on it pretty good. Just got beat by the pitch. And he challenged Strawberry, and he does so again. And this time, Darryl laces it into left center, and it's going to fall for a base hit. Carter going to third. Strawberry going to second, and no one there to take the throw. It's a double for Strawberry, and the Mets have runners at second and third with nobody out. We've talked about this a lot. Darryl Strawberry moving the ball to left field. I think it's been the key to his success. Done fastball tailing away out over the plate. Strawberry doesn't hit it as hard as he can. He gets jammed just a little bit on that, but he's so strong, he hits that ball out into left center. You, you were right about nobody covering second base, Steve. Green was following the play. There's Strawberry swing. You can see his eyes were all the way going the other way. I love to see that. The Valier out to talk to Mike Dunn, and obviously this will help Doran Taylor in his warm-up should Jim Leland elect to make a change. And look at Strawberry. Everything's there. That ball jammed him just a touch, or he might have really drove that ball right out of the ballpark. And Vance Like made a perfect throw to the bag at second. I don't think it would have been able to get Strawberry even if someone had been covering. And now, what happened on that? Ray Steve? Miller out of the dugout, the Pirate right. pitching coach. Green thought that ball was going to be in the gap, and he was coming all the way in to be the cutoff man as far as if Carter was going to try to score. Then when he saw the throw going to second, he kind of veered back towards second. It did make the play. But everybody assuming that Darryl Strawberry was going to drive that ball through the gap, that ball jamming him a little bit fooled everybody. Well, Van Slyke made a very good play to cut the ball off because it did appear that it had a shot to go by him. And if you're wondering where the shortstop and the second baseman were on a ball hit that deep in the gap, they both have to go out, especially with a runner having a possibility of scoring for a double relay. So Mookie Wilson will be the hitter, and this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the New York Mets and WWOR. It's intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or the use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Mets and WWOR-TV is prohibited. Fouled out of play for strike one. Wilson is 0 for 2. He did pick up an RVI, his 14th of the year, when he reached on a fielder's choice in the first. That's when the Mets scored their two. The Pirates added one in the top of the third. And it's two to one with nobody out in the bottom of the sixth inning. And the Mets have runners at second and third. Strike two. Carter at 
third and Strawberry at second. Just outside and low, one ball, two strikes. Mookie has hit 414 over the last nine games and 339 in his last 36. Roger McDowell now loosening for New York. Off speed line on one hop to Bream, and they've got Carter hung up between third and home. Strawberry goes to third. Wilson goes to second. Now Carter allows himself to be tagged out as he gave Mookie Wilson enough time to get to second base. Gary Carter does one heck of a job here. Everyone knows his feet are all messed up from the ball. Mookie Wilson hits this ball firmly at first base. Uh, for Bream, to the plate. Third baseman. Now watch Gary Carter get this run. Now Mookie Wilson's trying to get to second base. That's Carter's job. Let Mookie Wilson get to second base. Now he knows the faster runners are actually on third and second. Mookie Wilson, pull it. Coming around. The ball's to the plate. He sees it. He realizes it's a rundown. He knows he's in second base. He can see the, the way the eyes of the defensive players are. They're looking at that runner at third base. He knows he can go to second. Howard Johnson will be given an intentional pass to load the bases with one out and put the double play in effect. As Mookie Wilson reaches on the fielder's choice. Carter retired 3-2-5-2. And the acquisition of Bill Allman is going to give Davey Johnson a lot of leeway here. As you see, Lee Mazzelli is coming into the on-deck circle. He's got both Allman who can come in at short. He can move Howard Johnson over to short. He can use his people when he wants to now. Excellent acquisition by the New York Mets. And even though Rafael Santana has been a hot hitter, as you look at the Pirates' brain trust, Lee Mazzilli will apparently pinch hit for Santana. Mazzilli, of course, a switch hitter. So there's not much in the way of an advantage for a change on the part of Leland in this, unless he just figures that Mike Dunn has had enough. Besides, the only pitcher the Pirates have had warming up is Taylor, who is also a right-hander. So, big manager Leland in this situation, Steve, wants to give Dunn every chance to work himself out of this. You hate to take a kid out of his, his first start in the big leagues in the middle of a big uh, rally. He would if he would give up some runs here. But being as so far he has not, he's going to let him go. Well, it is a two-to-one ball game. But the Mets have the bases loaded with one out. And Lee Mazzilli, who's batting 343 overall with a homer and three RBIs, will pinch hit. Maz is 8 for 21, as you see, with, a, with his home run and RBIs coming as a pinch hitter. Dave Magadan has stepped into the on-deck circle. So back-to-back -back lefties. So with Roger McDowell warming, that might be all for Dwight Gooden. It depends on if Mazzilli keeps the inning going, and he fouls the first one off. Strike one. Unless Maz hits into a double play, I think you're going to see a change. You might even see the change even if he does. Lee Mazzilli looking for his 1,000th career base hit. One and one. And there's the doctor talking to Rick Aguilera with that right arm covered up. Doc's got his bat in his hand. You know the Doc wants to get up there to hit. Just outside, two and one. Lee Mazzelli picked up his first big league hit in 1976 against the Cubs at Wrigley Field. It was a pinch hit home run. That was 999 hits ago, as well as 11 seasons. So he's looking for number 1,000. And that's on the inside corner, two and two. That's some kind of location for a two ball, one strike pitch with one out and the bases loaded ball just came back and caught the inside corner. Look at that pitch. Actually, that had a little more of the plate. I think Maz felt that ball was going to be inside. It just tailed back over the plate. Driven high and deep into left center field. 
Bonds makes the catch on the track, but Strawberry will tag and score and alertly. Mookie Wilson tags and moves to third. So Lee Mazzilli drives in the third New York run of the night. That's Lee Mazzilli's job in this situation. Here you're going to see Doc Gooden. They're going to let him hit. Mez, ball up and away, drives it into deep left center. Bonds realizes he cannot get the runner at second base. I mean, at home plate, throws the third. Howard Johnson came off on that ball once he realized, actually, that Bonds was going to catch the ball. If Howard Johnson could have got back to first base. He could have taken advantage of Bonds on that throw because he's not going to get Mookie Wilson at third base. That throw should have gone into second base. Howard Johnson, if he could have been a little more alert, might have been able to take advantage of that. However, runners at first and third now with two out for Gooden, who is 0 for 2. And fastball chopped right back to the pitcher and Mike Dunn. One hop sets the Sid Bream at first and the inning is over. But the Mets pick up a run on two hits and they leave two. Here in the sixth inning, we will go to the seventh. The doctor remains in the game as he leads the Pirates and Mike Dunn three to one. Now here's a word from Niccolo. George C. Scott becomes president Monday at 7.30 on Entertainment Tonight. Bill Allman does, in fact, come into the game in replacing Rafael Santana at short. And here's a look at Dwight Gooden's total of 90 pitches so far tonight. Now, when the doctor pitched in Tidewater, the most pitches he threw were 105. Ordinarily, a complete game for Doc is around 130 pitches on the average. So here he is through six innings with 90 pitches, and a large per percentage of those have been strikes. He has struck out only four, but remember this. He's facing a lineup that is full of guys that are very difficult to strike out. The Pirates have a lot of contact hitters. R.J. Reynolds, however, would be one of the more susceptible to the strikeout, but he has walked twice, and he fouls this pitch out for strike one. Reynolds to be followed by Mike Lavalier and Raphael Belliard as Dwight remained in the game when it appeared for a moment in the bottom of the sixth that he might be lifted. Now Gooden is up to 94 miles per hour. His slowest fast pitch, meaning not a breaking ball or a changeup at 88. One and one to RJ. Reynolds hitting 308 with a homer and 14 RBIs. Actually, Johnny Ray and R.J. Reynolds have both struck out 18 times. And that's an upset for Johnny Ray. Yes, that's. But a, there that's, you go back to what you're talking about hitting in the number three hole. You're not kidding. I mean, R.J. Reynolds, that's a good strikeout count. Johnny Ray, it's not. Probably Morrison is the guy that strikes out the most for the Pirates. Let's see if we can check this for you. Morrison has struck out. 33 times, Bream 29, and Bobby Bonds 29. And RJ chased one that was low, and it's one ball, two strikes. Reynolds has hit New York pitching quite well so far this year. He's hitting 400 against the Mets. And was one of the more successful left-handed hitters against Dwight Gooden. Remember opening day. Took him deep, first time up but has had success against Dwight Gooden. Not tonight, however. Strikeout number five for the doctor. One out here in the seventh. And well, after, two, after two walks, Dwight Gooden decides to hit enough of that. Throws a great fastball out over the plate. Good moving pitch. Beats R.J. Reynolds. And the batter will be Mike Lavalier, and you can see there's more than one group of K's being hung around Chase Stadium tonight. Lavalier struck out looking on a breaking ball in the second inning and lined out to left field in the fourth, 0 for 2. Good breaking ball there. I'll tell you, when Lord Charles comes calling, a lot of knees start buckling. I'm, I'm very impressed with Dwight Gooden tonight, uh, mainly because of the changeup in the curveball. Not so much the fastball, but the off-speed pitches. Another breaking ball, this one outside, one and one. In 1986, Dwight Gooden struggled most of the first part of the year getting his curveball over the plate and getting any kind of off-speed pitch over the plate. Here he's been laid off all this time, comes back in, and this is one of his most efficient games 
and getting the curveball and a changeup over in good locations. Another breaking ball, one and two. When you see that left-handed hitter take that stride and he hits that front foot, watch the heel of that front foot. He's done. You know, it's just all gone. As soon as that front, that, that the toe says, excuse me, and the heel comes down, it's all over. There's a lot of other things involved, but that toe always tells you. High fastball foul back, and it's still one and two. Toe fading the heel. See you later. <laughs> heel and toe is good if you're an automobile racer, but doesn't work too well when you're trying to hit. Heel and toe works good in my running. Mine's kind of like a fast walk anyway. <laughs> Another breaking ball, and this one fouled off. Still one and two to Mike Lavalier with one out, and nobody on here in the seventh. The Mets are leading three to one, and of course, tonight's game, a sellout. Tomorrow afternoon's game is also a sellout, so don't bother coming to the park unless you already have a ticket. Sunday, however, the doubleheader and banner day, there are tickets remaining. Two and two now. And we also recommend that if you do have a ticket, try to use the mass transit system as much as you can. Parking, needless to say, is at a premium. Another high fastball foul back, still two and two. There's a look at the big crowd. Standing room only here at Shade of Night. And you can't get a standing room only ticket. Those are tough. They have been treated so far to the kind of outing they were hoping to see from Dwight Gooden. He leads three to one and has so far allowed just two hits. Fastball ripped up the middle by Backman for a base hit to center. Mike Lavalier, whether he's wearing a Cardinal uniform or a Pirate uniform, always seems to hit Mets pitching quite well. Third hit for Pittsburgh. In the National League, Nissan scoreboard, Cardinals beat the Cubs 5-1. to one. In the seventh inning, all tied up six apiece. Montreal at Philadelphia. In the eighth inning, 4-2, to two, the Padres in Atlanta. Padres are ahead, 4-2. to two. In the sixth inning, 6-4, to four, Dodgers over the Reds in Cincinnati. And in the top of the fifth inning, the Astros 3-1 to one over the Giants in Houston. Your attention, please. Dwight talking to Bill Howard Myers. Johnson and grimacing a little Betting bit. For shortstop, Rafael Bellia. Activity now in the Met bullpen. Number 25, Bobby Bonilla. And the Pirates have a pinch hitter, Bobby Bonilla, who will pinch hit for Rafael Belliard. Bonilla will hit from the left side. Bobby Bonilla is hitting 250 on the year. He's had nine pinch hits, or pinch hit at bat so far this year. Had two hits, no home runs, and two RBIs. I'm a little surprised they've gotten so many people in that outfield. This guy was really expected to get some playing time this year. He's the odd man out. He drills one deep down the right field line. Into the corner off the wall and by Strawberry. Lavalier does not run well, but he's rounding third. And here's the throw from Strawberry. And Lavalier is out. See Bonilla just jump all over this fastball. It's right in his zone. Almost a home run, just off the top of the wall. The ball goes by Strawberry. Picks it up. Lavalier, slow runner. Strawberry over everybody. But the throw comes well enough, and Gary Carter just stands there and takes the blow from Lavalier. Give Gary Carter a lot of credit for this. Strawberry makes an excellent throw in that he gets the runner. The ball's over everybody, but Carter knows he's going to get hit here. Outstanding play by Gary Carter. Excellent throw. Not in the fact that it was to hit a cutoff man, but it works on this particular play. Well, you got to give Darrell some credit, too, because he hustled after that ball after it got by him. The big thing was he picked it up clean and made a throw right to the plate. And watch Carter tag with the bare hand. And Tim McCarver will tell you as a catcher, if you hold that ball in your bare hand, you will not drop it. 
If you hold it in the glove, chances are it could be knocked out. An outstanding play both by Strawberry to recover nicely and make the strong throw and Carter's block of the plate and tagging out Mike Lavalier. So two out here in the inning, Bonilla is at third, and John Cangelosi will pinch it for pitcher Mike Dunn. Cangelosi hitting only 209 on the season is one for 13 as a pinch hitter. Cangelosi has a phenomenal on base percentage of 521 so far this year. We talk about Mike Sosha blocking the plate. The guy with the Dodgers who is injured right now. Gary caught a lot of credit there. And I'll tell you, we talked about Tim McCarver. Tim McCarver was one of the toughest people behind home plate I played against. Timmy talks about how as you see a ball inside. This is where the, the men come out and the boys go home right here. You're looking at it. Boy, Carter took an elbow from Lavalier, a fellow catcher, who certainly knows what it is to block home plate. And hung right in there. Strike to Cangelosi in the count now one and one. And to finish my remarks, as much as you hear Tim McCarver talk about Socia and some of the other catchers, he was hard as nails behind that plate, folks. Hard as nails. Timmy played the whole game that way. You're not kidding. Good breaking ball. I'll tell you, the doctor brought somebody with him to the park tonight, and that's Lord Charles. Well, it's been his best pitch. He's had some great fastballs, but the curveball has set everything up tonight. Normal human beings throw Uncle Charlie, not this guy. <laughs> There's another one. Angelosi almost took a step toward the dugout. He was not. Watch this little flinch after. He almost thinks, no, don't call that on me now. That's, that's a little up. Two and two. Angelosi not very tall, so not a big strike zone. That breaking ball in the dirt in the count full. So three and two to John Cangelosi pinch hitting for pitcher Mike Dunn. Two out. Bobby Bonilla at third base for the Pirates and the Mets leading three to one. We're in the top of the seventh inning. We'll see what Gary Carter and Dwight Gooden put together here, but Cangelosi's got to be thinking fastball right now. It is a fastball, but it's too high, and Cangelosi on base again as he continues to display that good eye fourth walk issued by Gooden who has struck out five and here comes Davy Johnson and Davy's going to go to Roger McDowell right now that's well, Jesse Orozco that Davy is asking for so the left hander will come in to pitch to Barry Bonds as Dwight Lee and another standing ovation for the doctor Right back to Shea after this for Nissan. Well, Dwight Gooden receiving the standing ovation as he went into the dugout, had to come back out for a curtain call and got an even louder cheer from the crowd when he did so. And I would have to say that the doctor's outing has been everything you could have hoped for. And here's Jesse. Jesse's in his 21st game now. He's got a 1-5 and five record with a 5.70 earn run average. He's had 10 saves. And in 32 and two-thirds innings, he's given up 29 hits, had 30 strikeouts, and walked nine. Jesse Roscoe's year has been a little erratic. He has either gotten him out completely or he's had bad outings. There's been hardly any in between for Jesse Roscoe. He has been Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There's no question about that. Barry Bonds is 0 for 3. Runners at first and third with two out. And a breaking ball for a strike. Bonds has struck out twice and flied to left twice. The inning started with R.J. Reynolds striking out. Then Mike Lavalier single to center. Bobby Bonilla pinch hit a double off the right field wall with Lavalier being thrown out at home by Strawberry. Strike two. Then John Cangelosi worked out a walk. And Jesse Orozco on to pitch to 
Barry Bonds. And there you see Jesse Orozco's Lord Charles. That's Jesse Orozco's best pitch. And he better stay alive for Cangelosi here. Two strikes, two outs. Time for some activity. Fastball fouled away, and the count remains 0 and 2. Dwight Gooden goes six and two thirds tonight before Roscoe comes on in relief. And Dwight gave up just four base hits. He struck out five, and he walked four. He is, of course, responsible for the base runners aboard right now, and to this point has only given up one run. I certainly would be aggressive on the bases right now, Steve, if I was the manager. Breaking ball, see you later. Jesse Orozco slams the door here in the seventh inning, striking out Barry Bonds with runners at first and second. So Dwight Gooden leaves the game in a situation where he can only be the victor tonight. And we'll be back with the Mets leading 3-1 to one after this for AT&T. Say, fans, even though tomorrow afternoon's game is sold out against the Pirates, Sunday's game is not. And it's Banner Day, Emerson Banner Day, on Sunday beginning at 1 o'clock, a doubleheader, when the Mets take on the Pirates to wind up this series. You're invited to enter this traditional Banner Day contest between games of the doubleheader with thousands of dollars worth of prizes to be given away, including the grand prize of a 25-inch remote control color television set from Emerson and a VHS stereo video cassette recorder. Banners must be carried by one or two persons, and they will be judged on neatness and originality. That lets me out. Tickets are available at all Ticketron outlets at Chase Stadium's advanced ticket window, or you can call 718-507-TIXX during regular business hours for all ticket information. So come on out to Shea and bring your banners on Sunday against the Pirates, Emerson Banner Day. And fans on Saturday, June 20th at 7.05 p.m., it'll be the Mets versus the Philadelphia Phillies. It'll also be Con Meets Kid Jersey Night, as all fans 14 and under will receive a replica Mets jersey, courtesy of Con Meets. As Steve said, tickets are always available at all Ticketron outlets, Shea Stadium's advanced ticket window, or by calling 718-507-TIXX during regular business hours. Bobby Bonilla remains in the game for Pittsburgh and will play third base. And John Smiley will be on the mound for the Pirates. It's his 25th game. 3-1 record with a 4.91 earned run average. He has two saves. Given up 18 walks. Had 28 strikeouts. Given up 30 hits in 33 innings. And a first pitch to Lynn Dykstra. Ball one. And a little tight. You can see that Dykstra, after going to Eskimo City with... Mookie Wilson, as they went nose to nose in the outfield, has his nose very heavily taped. We have not received a report, but it could be that it is broken. Morrison is at shortstop, and Belliard, of course, was removed from the game for Bonilla, the pinch hitter. So Bonilla stays in the number eight hole in the batting order. Morrison moves to short, and Bonilla at third. Strike call, two balls and one strike to Dykstra. Lenny's two for three. He has singled twice and struck out. center field and slight with plenty of room and there's one away here in the seventh Barry Bonds the batter with the tying runs aboard in the top half of this inning and here's his reaction to a Roscoe's strike three well, I would say he's a little disturbed Jesse Roscoe put a outstanding curveball on him your attention players swinging very Welcome freely Mets. on a pitch that might not have been in the strike zone. baseman how about was not in the strike zone? Number 11, Tim. There's Tim Tuffle, the pinch hit for Wally Backman. Backman was 0 for 2 plus a walk and a run scored. And Tuffle, as you see, hitting 338. Tuffle, as a pinch hitter, has had two hits in five at bats. One of them a big home run. Nobody on in the seventh. Mets leading three to one in a fastball from Smiley missed, and it's 0 and 2. Out of play, and the count remains 0 and 2. Mike Dunn 
making his major league debut in less than perfect circumstances. 55,000 against him on the road in the doctor's return. Pitched well, six innings. Gave up three earned runs on four hits. He struck out one. He did walk six. One of those was an intentional pass. Foul straight back by Tuffle, still 0-2. Eric Davis has hit a three-run home run. His 20th of the year. What a year he has had. You add to that the offense that he has produced. You add to that the tremendous defense he's played. Three or four times he's taken home runs away. Tuffle with a shot under the glove of Morrison and into left center. That ball was scalded, and Morrison tried to pick the one hopper on the short hop and couldn't come up with it. We'll see how they score. Well, he certainly hits this ball extremely hard. Gets all of it right on the meat of the bat. Right in the screws. Morrison unaccustomed to shortstop. Certainly did not make a major league play there. I don't know if we're going to get a hit or an error here, Steve. That ball should have been stopped. Randy Myers and Terry Leach warming for New York. And they have scored at a base hit. And here's Keith Hernandez with Tuffle at first and one out. As a hitter, you're always very pleased at that decision. Smiley with a fake break to first as he stepped off, and Hernandez asked for time. Whenever you hit a ball extremely hard, you hope to get the benefit of the doubt. But a major league shortstop is supposed to stop that ball. I don't care if he is a third baseman. <laughs> he should shortstop now. Tuffle gets the chase back to first. One out. And Hernandez, who was 0 for 2 tonight, he reached on an error and scored in the first, walked and flied to right, working on an 11-game hitting streak. Foul tipped into the glove. 0 and 1. Keith has hit 386 over his previous 11. Taking a piece of tape off that finger. There's all different kinds of tapes now, nowadays. That's a, a real, actual piece of adhesive tape. They have stretch tape, which sometimes has a, is a little better for you because it doesn't cut your fingers so much. Something that really, an advancement in, in the medical end of it, really is a plus. Fouled out of play by Hernandez, and he's in the hole now 0-2. But it's tough to get hitters to change something that they've been doing on a regular basis. I've talked to Keith Hernandez about that because his fingers are always torn up. He uses a lot of pine tar. He doesn't use gloves. His fingers are always sore. You know, the skin is breaking open and everything. When you use that tape, that actually, it, it does cover, but it has a tougher edge than that stretch tape. There's a stretch tape, a little off-colored, almost skin-colored tape that uh, has some flexibility to it, which is really a great innovation. That's been around a while, too. Smiley has been tough. Lately, he's worked five and a third scoreless innings in his last four outings. He has struck out three and given up just two hits in his last four appearances before tonight. And he's come a long way, Steve, from Prince William in 1986, finishing the season with Pittsburgh. Had a 1-0 record in 86. But they are certainly looking forward to Smiley in the future of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Hernandez fouls another one off, and the count remains 0-2. New York scoring two in the bottom of the first inning. Pittsburgh got their run in the third, and the Mets added one in the sixth inning to lead 3-1. to one. What you just saw was Keith Hernandez looking at those fingers. They are torn up, and they don't heal during the season, folks. Another foul out of play. So Smiley coming right after Hernandez and Keith so far equal to the task. I was never someone who wore gloves until I injured my hands. I was a big pine tar man. The seams of your skin actually open up when you use a lot of pine tar. And finding a way to cover up those seams certainly helps when you're hitting. Nothing worse than cracked fingers. They're just part of the game. Grounded sharply. Fair ball. 
Couple going to third. Reynolds runs it down as Hernandez goes to second, and here comes Couple. He will score. Hernandez going to third with a triple. New York leads four to one, and Jim Leland right out of the dugout to talk to the first base umpire, John McSherry, about some possible interference or perhaps a ground rule. A agreed, Steve. It could have been either one. We don't see that angle here from the booth, but uh, in all probability, that ball got tied up in the fence down there. Leland's trying to say that if this ball gets caught underneath, it's supposed to be a ground rule double. If a fan touches it, it's a ground rule double. That guy did not touch it, but if that fan touches it, they, they might rule that he interfered with his vision or something, and that's what Leland's trying to do, get any edge he can. The ball did not touch the fan. That's what the umpire is going to go on here. He is going to call this a triple. The fan is going to fall out of the stands, but he is not going to touch the ball. There's no erratic hop there. What he did was touch the warning track with his face. We may give him about a two on that dive, but it's certainly he will remember that dive in the morning when he takes that gravel out of his teeth. Well, I think given a choice, he might have wanted to pull off the kissing that Mookie Wilson and Len Dykstra did rather than kissing that warning track. I'll tell you what, Mookie Wilson, Len Dyshirt, they, they hurt themselves. They're playing under the rest right now. Lenny Dyshirt, they said it was a, just a cut on his nose, but until you see something like that, you really never know how bad it is. Well, Leland continues to try to make his point with McSherry. He the is going to lose this, the, too. The play will stand, and here's the ball going over the bag. Ball is fair. The ball is over the bag. It's fair. He's arguing that the fan interfered with his player's ability to go after the ball correctly. But I'll tell you one thing, as we look at the play again, over the bag and down the line for a triple. Ball fair immediately. Even if R.J. Reynolds had not bobbled this ball, and Leland's claiming apparently that the fan falling out of the stands caused him to do so, there's no way they would have gotten Tuffle at home plate. You can tell that the, as the ball bounces by the fan, the, the Tuffle scored. What a dive. <laughs> Lost his beard, gravel in the cheeks. Tuffle scored by the time the ball came into Bream, the cutoff man. Bream didn't even have a play. So I think that the argument is rather inconsequential, except perhaps for the fact that if it is ruled to be fan interference, Tuffle would not be allowed to score, and Hernandez would have to go back to second. Well, Jimmy Leland's going to either get thrown out of this game and get mad, or he's going to go back to the dugout, because John McSherry has already made his decision that the fan did not touch the ball. I think John is showing amazing patience, too, because he's still discussing it rather calmly. John McSherry is an outstanding umpire, folks. Uh, everybody gets on him because of his size, but he's, he's a real technician. He knows the rules and is just a, a, a real great representative of anybody who's ever worn that umpiring uniform. Well, apparently, the discussion has ended now. It, Leland apparently has asked for some help on the play. Frank Pulley, the second base umpire now, coming over with McSherry. Uh, the umpires are showing tremendous, uh, not, not only patience, but trying to work this thing out the right way. For an umpire to go to another umpire in those situations is very, very difficult. When a manager says, go ask somebody else, it's saying you didn't call the play right. And most umpires don't do it. Again, John McSherry, an outstanding umpire. Well, you want to make the correct call. That's the umpire's job, is to make the right call and be sure you made the right call. And apparently, whether Leland's going to be satisfied or not, John McSherry made the right call. Well, he has. The, uh, the reason why he's gotten this cooperation is because he's handled himself well. If he had come out ranting and raving, I don't think you would have seen the kind of cooperation he's got. Now, he may get there right now, <laughs> okay, because he's do, done all the pleading he can do. He's either got to leave the field now or rant and rave and get thrown off the field. And Davey's saying, let's go here. Well, the business at hand is that it's an RBI and a triple for Hernandez. Keith's 22nd RBI of the year. Davey says, come on, let's go. And it also extends Hernandez's hitting streak now to 12 consecutive games. And Jim Leland is apparently going to be able to remain in the game. He is not, however, going to the dugout. He is going. Oh, I see. He's just going around LaValle. So the Mets have a runner at third, a run in to lead four to one, and one out in the inning for Gary Carter. Jim Leland has certainly done a, a marvelous job 
instilling spirit Potter. in this young pirate ball club. A lot of credit has to go his way. I think the guys probably enjoy playing for him as much as any manager. He's a player's kind of manager. And he, he demands one thing. He demands they put out and hustle and give him everything they got. And if they don't, that's when he gets mad. Well, he's had very good reviews so far. Carter one for two. He has walked, grounded into a double play, and singled to center. And he's up here now with the infield in. Runner at third and one out here in the bottom of the seventh. And the fastball is inside for ball one. When you're a young manager with a young team, you know there are going to be some mistakes that you're going to have to live with. But they can't be mistakes of not giving your effort. Carter hits a fly ball deep to center field. Van Slyke turns and runs off the wall. Carter rounding second will hold there as Hernandez walks home with the fifth New York run. And Gary Carter with a second hit picks up his 26th RBI. Again, we're going to see Gary Carter here staying, keeping that left shoulder in. He's going to drive this ball. Going right out at it. Shoulder square. Drives this ball off the center field wall. This is almost a nice play. Again, a right fielder playing center field. Kind of timed that ball. But Gary Carter certainly deserves a double on that. And Gary is at second for Daryl Strawberry, who doubled and scored his last time up. Daryl takes high, ball one. Van Slyke, he's kind of coasting there, looking at the ball. Now he checks the wall. When you go out into the wall, that's when you get in trouble. Way inside to Strawberry, two balls, no strikes. As that outfielder approaches the wall, he wants to be able to run and jump straight up in the air. That way, if he does hit the wall, it's not going to hurt him. When you have to go out into that wall, trust me, it hurts. There with a big cut, no contact. Two balls, one strike. Van Slyke really appeared as if he thought he had a play on that ball all the way, but it just kept carrying. You have to get back to the wall. That's the key. Again, he's not used to having that much room behind him. Another high fastball missed. Two balls, two strikes. We always talk about drifting. You know, sometimes it, it's almost, you, you just have to drift because you don't know exactly how the ball is traveling. But in normal circumstances, getting back to the wall, if it's going to be a ball that's that close, that's the way to go and then make your adjustments. Darrell lays off that pitch now. It's three and two. I like Darrell Strawberry's patience. He's a free swinger, and he's going to make some, some bad swings at the ball. But particularly now that they've been pitching him so tough, he's, he's really done a good job. And they have bad mouth him here as he strikes out. But Darryl Strawberry deserves a lot of credit in what I was telling you because Gary Carter's been slumping, and they've been pitching around him a lot. First strikeout for Smyer. Here's the Mets, number one. Two out in the inning, and Dave Johnson now throwing in the Pittsburgh bullpen. And the batter will be Mookie Wilson, who will now hit from the right-handed side of the batter's box against the left-hander Smiley. Mookie's 0 for 3, but he has driven in a run in the first inning. Bounded to first. Sid Bream will take it himself, and the inning is over. But the Mets score two on three hits here in the seventh inning. And after seven, New York up on top 5-1 to one over the Pirates. The doctor has left on the winning side of the ledger, and we're back after this for the good old sky. A sellout at Shea tonight, 53,269 showed up, 51,402 paid. Tim Tuffle stays in the game at second after pinch hitting for Wally Backman. Jesse Orozco, who got the final out in the bottom, or rather the top half of the seventh inning and replaced uh, Dwight Gooden still on the mound. And as we go to the eighth inning with the Mets leading 5-1, Back in is Tim McCarver. All right, Steve, thank you very much. Andy Van Slyke now will be facing Jesse Orozco. Van Slyke against Gooden was one for three. Gooden works six and two-thirds and giving up four hits and one run. Orozco coming in to strike out Bonds with two on in the seventh. Van 
looks like it bunning on his mind and he takes a strike and he disagrees with Billy Williams I think Van Slyke thought that he did not offer it that pitch looked like a strike and it's kind of hard for a left-handed hitter to argue whether it was a strike or not because most of them are gone if they're drag bunning that's right so you don't have the same perception of the strike zone five to one New York on top curve ball base hit good piece of hitting by Van Slyke and he leads off the eighth with a single Here's a Nissan American League scoreboard. Toronto beat Baltimore 6-2 in the ninth inning. Detroit leads Boston 3-2. In the fourth, the Yankees are shutting out Milwaukee 6-0. In the seventh, Texas all over Minnesota 11-3. And everything else is out on the West Coast a tad later, like about 10 minutes from now. That's a tad. <laughs> Johnny Ray the batter. And he gets up under one, shallow left field, Mookie Wilson in, and he makes the catch. A much easier catch for Mookie Wilson than back in the third inning. That extraordinary inning where all the outs were made by the outfielders, two by Wilson, one by Dykstra, all an adventure, and that scary scene to end the inning. Here's Sid Bream. We'll try to Bill Webb has that in capsule form. The next half inning, we'll try to show you all of those extraordinary outs made in the third inning. Good stop by Carter, 1-0. and The last out made when Wilson and Dykstra collided. Sid Bream was the batter, as a matter of fact, with two runners on and two out. It's hard to tell whether either Dykstra or Wilson made the catch initially. And of course, had that ball been dropped, Sid Bream has a, an inside the park grand slam. He'll settle for a single, this at bat. Or does he stay in there about as well as anybody in the National League against left-handers? Bream's second hit. Pittsburgh, shortstop. And Jim he has Morrison. the only two hits among the three, four, and five hitters in the lineup. And so their problems continue. Morrison's 0 for 3. And Bream 2 for 4. And Ray 0 for 3. Jesse Orozco trying to save it for Gooden. Gooden trying to turn a page in a Stephen King novel. Ball for a strike, 0 and 1. Outfield deep for Morrison. He has excellent power. Five home runs on the year. Taps one foul. That's that split finger fastball a la Orozco. Well, Morrison who had such a great month of April, started off so strongly. He hit 333 in April with four homers, homers rather, and 14 RBIs. His May went the other way. His May was a 217 average with only one home run. So he's hoping June will be April all over and not May once again. One and two to Morrison. Some feathers on his face for the first time that I've ever seen yeah. Jimmy wearing any kind of beard. This is one of those no shave until I break out of it beards. <laughs> Understand those. One and two to Morrison. Got him on the breaking ball, so Jimmy's going to have to wait for June to bust out all over. Two outs. The next Here's that patented the Roscoe breaking ball to right-handers down and in, and Morrison chases it. Fans of Mets want to remind you that the USA Today All-Star Balloting is going on here at Shea now through July 6th. So when you come on out, be sure to pick up your ballots and vote for your favorite players for this year's All-Star Game. R.J. Reynolds, the batter, he's 0 for 1 with a couple of walks. 5 to 1, New York on top. Swing and a miss, 0 and 1.
Roger McDowell now up. Part of the one-two punch of the Mets. Fly ball, right field. Easy play for Strawberry. And he makes the catch. No runs, two hits, two left. After seven and a half, five to one New York. We're back after this from New Jersey Bell. Very fashion. First, it was Barry Bonds who lifted one in foul territory. Mookie Wilson playing left, going over and watch this balletic move. A step up on the step and a fine play for the first out of the inning. Then the next hitter, Johnny Ray, well, actually one hitter later, hit one to left field, and Mookie lost it completely. But alertly, Dykstra adjusted to the ball and made the catch in dead left field. And Sid Bream, the very next hitter, hit a drive into the gap in left center, and here it was. Boom! Oh. Wilson and Dykstra colliding face to face. Mookie with a fat lip, Dykstra with a cut nose. And unbelievably, as we see it in slow motion, Mookie Wilson able to make the catch. And then as the collision happens, Dykstra's glove comes off. Mookie holds on to the ball. And most fortunate of all, neither player hurt seriously or having to leave the game for any amount of time. And a scary moment for the Mets. And how many times has Len Dykstra been involved in collisions in his short stint in the New York outfield? Mookie holding the ball saying, I've got it. Although he's not all there at the moment. The one that comes to mind was when Dykstra ran into Howard Johnson last year. And Johnson's going to lead off the bottom of the eighth inning. Hojo broke a bone in his forearm, had to be in a cast, missed about six weeks. And the pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates, there's Lenny. The results of that scary collision in the third. Steve so chronicles so well. Dave Johnson, the right-hander, is on the mound. And a sinker is low and away to Howard Johnson. Dave Johnson to Howard Johnson. And Dave Johnson with a record of 0-0 and no saves and a 9-0-0 earned run average. This is only his third appearance, and he's only worked three innings so far. Popped up. Left side, shortstop Jim Morrison under it, and an easy play, one away. Here are Dave Johnson's stats. Johnson last year was at Hawaii, where he was 8 and 7 with a 3.17 ERA. Bill Allman. Vancouver is now the AAA affiliate of the Pirates. And the batter, Bill Allman. And he takes the slider outside. Almond coming over from the Pittsburgh Pirates, so he's facing his old teammate for the first time. And he taps one foul, one and one. <laughs> I think the Tooth Fairy's been to her house. It's like part of that collision between Dykstra and Wilson back in the third inning. We got a couple of quarters. Do they get money for teeth anymore? I mean, it's been a we, while since I've done that, if you know what we, I mean. Yes, I do. We do to, we do to our children. Uh-huh. Has inflation caught up with parents yet? Two yeah, two, I, I'd have to say that uh, Stephanie, who's the only one who's lost any teeth so far, certainly made out a lot better than I did when I lost my first couple of teeth. Man of your wealth probably lives like 100 shares of IBM on the pillow for a per tooth. Sure. <laughs> a tapper, tapper toward short. Morrison guns out Alman. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, from a man who could buy and Here's sell the me out of his pocket. Number 47, Jesse Here's a Roscoe. Roscoe. <laughs> Matter of fact, I had just that in mind. That's why I brought some extra cash tonight. You're on the market. <laughs> Don't expect too much. Jesse, a good hitting pitcher. Fastball from Johnson. Davey Johnson, the right-hander, the third pitcher for the Pirates. And boy, what a catchy nickname. DJ, his teammates call him. The slider foul back. What took a lot of thought for that sober K. 0 and 2 to Roscoe. <laughs> well, he hadn't been around long enough, I guess, to acquire any, or at least display any traits that sometimes cause nicknames to pop up. Well, a 
Orozco doesn't pop up. He strikes out. A 1-2-3 inning for Johnson. It's 5-1 to one New York after 8. And we'll be back after this word from R.C. Cola. It's on top 5-1. to one, And tonight, for Dwight, we'll have to go down as a success. Dwight Gooden, working 6 and 2 thirds, gave up just one run, four hits, struck out five, and walked four. Leading off the ninth inning. And we want to remind you that tomorrow's game is a sellout. If you have tickets, come to the park and take mass transit if you can and come early. 1.30 start time. Sunday's doubleheader, Banner Day, is not sold out. Tickets are available. But again, we would suggest that you do use public transportation. Junior Ortiz to pinch hit for Mike Lavalier here in the ninth inning. And J.J., the former Met, hitting 246. Roscoe with a fastball for strike one. the right field wall in the seventh inning, pinch hitting for Raphael Belliard. And on the play, Mike Lavalier was thrown out at home by Daryl Strawberry with a fine block of the plate by Gary Carter. Strike one. Mike Diaz, one of the strongest guys in the game, on deck to pinch hit for the pitcher. One and one. I'll tell you, one of the beauties of this game, Steve, is to come to a ball game sometimes and from behind home plate, watch the choreography of the infielders and outfielders. Take a step when a, when a hitter swings and misses. And to see the outfielders coming in a step, the infielders coming in a step. One of the real beauties of the game when nothing happens. And something that you really have to be in the park to appreciate. Oh, that fastball ran right in on Bonilla and got both players. It hit Bonilla's bat or his hand on the bat, and then ricocheted off and got Gary Carter. It looked like it got Gary on the right knee. That knee can be exposed. We'll see if it got him on the leg. Oh, boy. Here it is once again. It appeared the left wrist Nope, hit him on the elbow, and then it came down, and I think it got Gary right between the legs. When catchers really get hurt, they get hit up and under that protective cup that they have on, and that ball appeared to go down and then come up. That's a, what it appeared to hit right between Gary's legs. All sorts of jokes go on naturally when things like that happen, but that's after you get back yeah, up from your knees. That's right. That's after the fact. And I'm sure Hernandez was whispering one of those things once he found out Gary was all right. And if Gary responded, it might have been uh, yeah, it in, a, in a higher octave. Yes, yes, that's right. It appeared that it hit his right elbow and then came down and then came up under that protective device that catchers have to wear. Delgado is hit by a pitch as Bonilla is at first base for Mike Diaz hitting 241 with seven homers and 16 RBIs. Diaz as a pinch hitter is three for 13 with a home run and four RBIs.
speed pitches outside for ball one. One out here in the ninth inning. The Mets leading five to one. It's one of the charms of a well-pitched game. A lot of hitters swinging through pitches. And to watch the outfielders and the infielders as the pitch is being swung through kind of makes you think. Makes you think that Bob Fosse might have invented the game of baseball instead of Abner Doubleday, right? <laughs> well, whether or not Abner invented it is certainly up to dispute. So why not throw Fosse's yeah, name sure, in? Sure, why not? It is, uh, when it's played right, a beautifully choreographed affair. Two balls and no strike to Mike Diaz, who checks out third base coach Gene Lamont. Bonilla only being semi held by Hernandez at first. And the fastball in there for strike one. Two and one. Kind of what all offensive linemen do. Semi hold. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's the truth. <laughs> well, I mean, almost every replay, the, the offense, as John Madden would say, you do what you can get away with. <laughs> and they get away with it a lot. <laughs> High and away. Three and one now to Mike Diaz. And even though Diaz has home run power, Orozco really needs to be challenging in this spot because the Mets do lead by four. And a home run by Diaz would only be worth two at the moment. And a fastball, but it's low. So after the opening strikeout in the inning, Orozco has hit Bonilla and walked Mike Diaz. And then to put runners at first and second with one out. And the batter will be Barry Bonds. Well, certainly nothing has come easy for the Mets all year long, and this game's no exception. A game that, with Orozco sailing right along, and now he hits Bonilla and walks Diaz. Roscoe finds himself flirting with trouble. Bonds is 0 for 4. He has struck out twice and flied out twice. He holds up, and it's ball one low. The Mets looking for the double play in the infield, but Bonds batting from the left side, as he always does. Very difficult guy to double up. has hit in seven of his last eight games hitting 400 before tonight but 0 for 4 so far he leads the National League in triples with five fouled off out of play one ball two strikes two now Jesse has picked up 10 saves but he has lost five ball games and has either been feast or famine Andy Van Slyke on deck well hit to right field but Strawberry should make the play and he does Bonilla faking as he tagged up at second but Strawberry with a strong throw and he holds there so two out in the inning. And Van Slyke is going to hit. Seven fielder, Andy Van Slyke. Van Slyke two for four tonight. Did get a base hit off of Roscoe in the eighth inning. Leading off, he singled the center but was stranded at second. You know, the more you see Jim Leland of the Pirates, the more you're impressed with him. I mean, Van Slyke hit less than 200 against left-handed pitching last year. But Leland realizes that Van Slyke, part of the future of the organization, they're not going anywhere. Ordinarily, he may put a guy, a right-handed hitter like Butch Davis up there. But he figures that Van Slyke's a good enough talent to learn how to hit lefties better, and you can't hit them by pinch hitting for them. Not only that, perhaps, and of course I'm only surmising here, if Van Slyke were representing the tying run, say, Possibly. in this situation, yeah. he might go to a right-handed hitting power hitter in an effort to tie the ball game up with two out. Foul off. And the count one and one. And he's 
been a hot hitter. Hitting in six of seven now with his two hits in this game tonight. He's driven in seven runs in the last seven games. And batted 429 over the previous six. Two on and two out in the ninth inning, and the Mets leading by four. The fastball is fouled away. It's one ball, two strikes. Anticipation begins to move through what remains of a sellout crowd here at Shea as we look for that final strike with two strikes and two outs in the night. Collective groan certainly let you know that everyone thought that pitch was close. Well, it's two and two. Three and two. Reminding Orozco that now the runners will be in motion with three and two and two out. Johnny Ray would represent the tying run if he gets to the plate. The ball got loose and Allman asked for time to get it off the field. Where it came from, I have no idea. Unless it was out of the stands. Three and two with two out in the ninth inning. Foul. We'll do it again. Bonilla was halfway home. Orozco has really dominated the Pirates this year. He has faced them three times, recording saves number one, two, and five against Pittsburgh. Gary going through a variation of signs. Ground ball to second. Tuffle to Hernandez and the Mets and Dwight Gooden win it. Jesse Orozco with save number 11. And everybody in New York Mets country is happy tonight because the doctor has come back and appeared in his first outing of 87 to be the Dwight of old as he wins his first outing here in 1987 going six and two thirds. And the Mets win it five to one with Orozco pitching the final two and a third innings, allowing just two hits and no runs. Tough combination here. Jesse Orozco can dominate left-handed hitters, and Andy Van Slyke has not been real successful against left-handed pitchers. So tonight, no exception. Jesse with his 11th save of the Thank year. A lot of happy Thank Mets so much here on their return to Shea. And so long for now. So the doctor wins it. And Mike Dunn making his Major League debut is the loser tonight. And the reaction of the Mets dugout, all right, it's on with business. And Timmy and I will be right back to wrap this one up for you. Ralph will have a Kiner's Corner in just a few minutes, so stay with us. Dwight Gooden returns, and he and the New York Mets have defeated the Pirates 5-1 to one here tonight at Shea. We're back after this for New York Telephone. Long-awaited 1987 debut of Dwight Gooden has been a successful one as far as the Mets and Gooden are concerned. To me, I don't think they could have asked for anything more under the circumstances. No, I'll tell you, I was uh, surprised. Uh, Dwight Gooden had five appearances in the minor leagues. I was mildly su uh, surprised at his effectiveness uh, tonight. I wasn't, however, surprised at uh, his velocity. I thought, Steve, that he would throw the ball well. I was really surprised at the control of the curveball, and he came out right. The second pitch of the game, he threw that nasty curveball to, to Barry Bonds in the big pitch 
in the ball game. He strikes LaValle out on a 3-2 curveball. So I think Gary handled him well, and I think Dwight's control was very, very good tonight. You know, there were a lot of elements here tonight that were sort of leaning toward Dwight Gooden having problems. Obviously, he had to feel a lot of pressure. Even if the Mets had not had the pitching problems and injuries that they had had this season, mm -hmm. he still would have felt pressure coming back. But under those circumstances, he had to feel like everybody has been looking for me to get back out there and do something. Maybe there was a little extra on him tonight. Yeah, and we saw him in naturally in 1984 and 85 through that great year in 85 uh, act as though nothing bothered him. But tonight, obviously, when he when he came out to perform, there was something bigger than just the phys his physical ability in question. And uh, it remains to be seen whether he can keep things in tow. But the first one's under his belt, and that's got to be the most difficult for him. We'll be back with more on the wrap-up here from Shea, where the Mets and Dwight Gooden have beaten the Pirates 5-1 to one after this for Niccolo. And we have the Budweiser plays of the game tonight. There were a couple of beauties, weren't there? <laughs> this is not your normal play of the game, either. This happened in the third inning. Sid Bream, the batter, Andy Van Slyke was on first base. And a drive by Bream into left center field. Mookie Wilson catching the ball while colliding with Len Dykstra. And the best part of the play of this game was that they both remained in the game and were not hurt. The other Budweiser play of the game was in the seventh inning. Mike Lavalier had singled, and Bobby Bonilla, pinch hitting for Raphael Belliard, lined a double off the right field wall by Strawberry. Lavalier sent home by third base coach Gene Lamont, and Strawberry up and firing. Carter blocking the plate beautifully, holding on to the ball, and a bare hand tag on Lavalier, who never did touch home plate. And it might have been one of the real key plays in the game as there was only one out at the time and there would have been two runners on base in what at that point was a much tighter ball game now this buds for you guys by the way Dykstra and Wilson for surviving they that. deserve one <laughs> if they can drink one <laughs> tonight right now at this moment Dwight Gooden is holding a news conference down in the New York Jets locker room they're using it in an effort to accommodate all the media that are here tonight and this has to be the second hurdle now, Timmy. He's, he's made the start. He's done well. He's going to feast the, uh, rather face the media tonight for the very first time. And the Mets have been under a lot of criticism for the yeah, way they they've have. sheltered him. Uh, this has to be a tough thing for him to go through now, too. Well, a lot of people don't understand that uh, most of the reasons uh, uh, that the Mets have sheltered Dwight Gooden have been uh, built around the fact that doctors have, have told the Mets how to handle Gooden. They thought it was part of his therapy. Uh, and treatment and actually an extension of his treatment that's the reason that the Mets have given and I find no reason not to believe that uh, and but tonight it is a very very difficult task to face the reporters and face them one by one the question Perfecting the experience open up the show here with Jerry Carter he asked is there any good any good books on this set and <laughs> there aren't any not even Gary's book or mine Oh, yours <laughs> yeah no it has to be well yours. as you can guess our special guest here tonight is Gary Carter and we'll be talking to Gary about the ball game and Dwight Gooden also we'll look at the highlights of the ball game and other things right after this message from Miller Lite beer <laughs> Carter and all things seem like good old days out here at Shea capacity crowd Dwight Gooden on the mound for the first time and Gary hitting the ball well in the ball game for the game, did you talk about anything with Dwight before the game? No, I was just really trying to, if anything, just settle him down. I went down to the bullpen and caught him a little bit before the game, and uh, uh, he seemed to be really psyched up. I know his adrenaline was pumping, and when you're going to pitch in front of over 50,000 people, that's bound to get anybody excited. And uh, we were all really happy and uh, uh, really pumped up that he was going to be back on the mound tonight. And uh, you could feel it all over New York City. So uh, it was just a great feeling, and uh, the intensity level was extremely high tonight. And certainly the Mets were up for this ball game. It, it had to be a big surge of energy for the Mets to have him back on the mound because the Mets, as everyone, everyone knows, really hurt him for pitching. Absolutely, Ralph. There's no question about it. And, uh, getting hurt, losing Bobby Ojeda, uh, then David Cohn, and then, of course, Ricky Aguilera, who's been on the disabled list for a while now. And uh, I'll tell you, it's amazing, you know. And then, of course, the collision tonight with Lenny and Mookie, and you say, what? what's next you know it's amazing and uh yet we keep hanging in there and we keep battling back i feel that we had a great road trip and all and come back and win tonight's ball game and uh even though it's a short homestand uh, hopefully this will get us going again they're going to instead of calling you the kid they're going to call you the kid quarter zone kid oh, or something geez. like that you've been shooting that pretty good too haven't you? well i have had quite a few uh, quarter zone shots this year ralph and it's only just due to the little nagging injuries and all that that occur and uh um, somebody started calling me a uh, father time and everything because I'm starting <laughs> to crumble a little bit but uh, 
I'm hanging in there. You know, it's, it, it happens to everybody. And being a catcher, you're always going to be vulnerable to foul tips and collisions at home plates and things like that. But uh, uh, the most important thing is, is that we keep winning. And uh, if I can just help and contribute, that's all that uh, matters. Well, you did that tonight. One other thing about the ball game: How'd you like Dwight's fastball? Was it good? I thought there was a. Uh, he was sporadic at times, but mostly uh, he got on top. And there was a couple of times, uh, especially in the the first inning uh, with Barry Bonds, the ball took off on him, and then uh, a couple of the strikeouts, his ball was starting to move again, just like he had had it back in uh, '85 and '84. And uh, his curveball was extremely good tonight. Uh, we mixed in a, a few. Curves, yeah, right? a lot of curves, but we also mixed in a few changeups. He threw a great 3-2 curveball to strike out Lavalier. And, uh, you know, th this is the way Dwight uh, needs to set up his, uh, his fastball, basically. This is something I didn't feel that he had quite as much control with last year, his breaking ball and his changeup. But uh, I didn't feel, you know, at all that I uh, couldn't call it because he was there. He was right on top of it. In fact, he shook me a couple of times to the curveball. Well, let's take a look at some of the action. This is Barry Bonds leading off the ball game. And Dwight making his first pitch of this season. And Barry Bonds, of course, a fine hitter. And Down the fastball there. Fastball there, yeah. Good curveball. Good snapping curveball. Real too. tight roll. Yeah. And then the fastball that looked like it took off a little bit there. And of course, that was a bit of a waste pitch. Another fastball, boom. See, it took off a little bit. So the first batter that Gooden pitched to struck out by Dwight Gooden. That's the start of his action here tonight. In the bottom of the sixth inning, Gary Carter batting at this point. And the single up the middle. This is, uh, these things are always welcome when you're Oh, boy, I'm somebody. telling you, Ralph, anything is welcome when it uh, doesn't matter sometimes if it's just a little, little hit or, uh, or a ball off the end of the bat or what have you, as long as uh, you just get it through the middle. Here's a big play in the ball game. Mets are leading three to one right here. And the double, and here comes Levayard in the home. Now watch Gary Carter. Ooh. Well, Ralph, that was about the only way that he was gonna uh, try to get to home plate. I was, uh, Darrell made the play, really. It was uh, an outstanding uh, play. He made the, the, the great throw, and uh, that's what made the play. And here's a double hit off the center field fence by you, <laughs> and a RBI, and you come up with a strong hit right there. It's Keith Hernandez, who had tripled, comes in to score. So, two hits in the ball game and a big, big double for you. That had to be, that had to be good because uh, you're looking for the long ball, right? right? Well, no, actually, I was just looking for a, a long fly ball just to be able to drive Keith in from third base, and, and Smiley is a pretty much of a fastball pitcher, and all I was trying to do was just drive the ball up the middle, and uh, fortunately, I was able to get the good part of the bat on the ball, and nothing could feel better than uh, when you hit it on the good part of the bat, so I was just glad for the RBI and, uh, you know, capitalize a little bit more, put a little bit more cushion on the, on the victory tonight. Oh, well, Gary Carter, thank you, Gary, and congratulations on a big night. Okay, Ralph. Got to be a okay. real thrill to see Dwight come back. You bet. We'll return to look at the highlights of the ball game right after this message from NatWest USA. First victory of the year. This was his 100th game start in his major league career and a fine game as he came back to start the season here on June the 5th. Checking out the highlights, well, the Mets got a little help from the Pirates in the first inning. Two errors by Pittsburgh, and right here, a big one right at this point, a possible double play, and Balliard, this, Balliard, the shortstop, unable to hold on to the ball. The Mets get their first run of the ball game. It's 1-0. The Mets added another run to make it 2-0. And here is a big curveball strikeout on Mike Lavalier, and it was as good a curve as you'd want to see. Then in the top of the third, Milky Wilson comes in to make this spectacular catch in foul territory right against the railing, and that's one of three outstanding plays in the inning. You're going to be looking at one right here. Ball hit out the left field, and the ball is lost by Mookie. And Len Dykstra comes in right behind him and makes a catch on Johnny Ray's sacrifice fly. Pirates get their run, their only run of the ball game, on that play. But now you'll see the play of the game right here. And it's again Mookie Wilson and also Lenny Dykstra. Sid Bream is the hitter. He hits a fly ball to the left. And right here it would have put the Pirates in front if the ball had not been caught. But somehow, Mookie Wilson held on to the ball. He holds it up here. It is caught. If it had not been caught, it would have been a three-run home run inside the park. So a good job right there by Mookie. 
In the bottom of the sixth, with one out, bases loaded, Lee Mazzilli hits a drive to deep left center field. It goes as a sacrifice fly. Strawberry comes in to score, and the Mets are leading by a score of three to one. Then in the top of the seventh inning, one out and runners on first, and a runner on first, pinch hitter Bobby Bonilla doubles to right, and Daryl Strawberry, after playing the ball off the wall, makes a perfect throw home. Carter blocks the plate. The Vallier comes in, tries to bowl over Carter, can't do it, and the out has made it home plate. At that point, it would have been three to two if he had not made the play. Now, right now, it is Keith Hernandez with a line drive down the line. It goes as a three base hit. And a run scores as Tuffle comes in to score. Tuffle had singled, and the Mets end up with another run and a runner on third. Then Gary Carter with a drive to center field off the fence in deep center field at the 410 mark. And on the play, Keith Hernandez comes in to score, and the Mets are now leading by a score of 5 to 1 in the ballgame. So, with the Mets leading by a score of 5 to 1, the last out of the ballgame coming with two men on base, a ground ball to Tuffle with throw to first base for the final out. And Jesse Orozco picks up the save. Jesse came in to pick up a big strikeout.